We're going to go ahead and call to order the October 25th meeting of the Metro Transit District Board of Directors. Uh, can we have our safety debrief, please? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for everyone's safety and reminders, um, in the event of an evacuation, uh, the main exit is just directly to the rear, main evacuation route, just really to the rear, through the hallway outside. And the where the meeting place will be is where the driveway and the street meet, right on the top part, right here. If that evacuation route is blocked, then we would go directly behind the main doors behind me. Downstairs, do not take the elevator in the event of a um, in the event of a fire, you know, in the fire or one of those type of situations. Uh, go out right out the front door, and then the evacuation assembly area is again near the driveway and the parking lot downstairs next to the street. Um, in the event, we have an AED, automated, uh, oh, we screwed up that name, <laughs> defibrillator. Um, it's downstairs. Um, in the event of a medical emergency, you go downstairs, turn on the device, and it will tell you the instructions on how to properly operate it. Give you little automated messages. In the event of an earthquake, um, Everyone would need to get under the tables um, and wait out, wait out the earthquake. Anyone by the windows should move away from the windows. Um, and for, yep, exactly. Wait for the earthquake to stop. And then once it's stopped and everything has settled, exit out the evacuation routes if possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Director Brown? Here. Director Downing? Here. Director Dutra. Here. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Present. Director Koenig. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director mm -hmm. McPherson. Here. Director Newsom. Present. Director Pegler. Here. Director P. Rose Carter has not been doing this yet. Director Rockin. Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Here. And ex officio Director Riskin will be absent today. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our announcements, starting with uh, today's meetings being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Language Line Services is providing Spanish interpretation, which will be available during oral communication and for any other agenda item for which these services are needed. Uh, Hector Guzman is providing Spanish interpretation today. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning, board. Good morning to everybody here. Um, my name is Hector, and I'll be providing interpretation services on any topic on the agenda. Uh, please let the board know if you need any assistance. Mi nombre es Hector. Yo estaré dando asistencia en español para cualquier punto en, en, que se va a tratar hoy en, en la junta de hoy. Uh, si necesitan ayuda, por favor, me a ver a, a, la, a, la, a la mesa directiva. Gracias. Thank you. All right, we'll go now to item five, which is board of director comments. Yes, please. I have a couple of things I wanted to share with you all. Sorry I missed last month. We have um, Indigenous Day on the last Friday of the month, uh, last so Cabrillo so celebrates that now, so that'll be a part of our calendar. Um, this with Cabrillo is in their last year of the Metro contract, so students will go to vote in April. Their elections will include that. They'll have to do a lot of postings around the campus in order to inform the students about the transportation vote which is part of their constitution, and that will be up. So if anybody is interested in tabling, having a special session, information, um, please do contact me so we can set some stuff up, probably March um, before we start talking about it being on the ballot. Then I'm not sure if anyone is aware, but Cabrillo is in a conversation about housing. We will be finalizing um, our vendors. We're hoping in a couple of weeks, we'll take it to our November board. We have about 625 plus or minus beds that we're going to be hosting. 60% um, will be slated for Cabrillo students, 40% in our partnership with UC Santa Cruz. And we are on schedule for a 2027. Great, thank you. Any other comments from the board? Yeah. I had one that's just um, somewhat related to uh, number 9 and 10. Um, just the, the new route structure from Watsonville, um, talk to Mr. Ergo about it. Uh, and just to get the timeline of, of going, I think it's about a 35 minute. Uh, 
little Santa Cruz town. I don't. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just wanted to get an idea because I just see it's you know, a resolution, and I just wanted to get a sense of how things are working. Which item are you referring to? Uh, Which item? Not just hand, just about a resolution about the uh, SV one. Oh yeah, uh, so that's a. It's a different thing, but I just wanted to. Well, get it's related. Um, I got the email from from Jenny and under, yeah. understaff. Uh, I think there may be confusion between the travel time and the frequency of service that we're operating. So yeah. with Reimagine Metro, we're now operating uh, one route, the Route One, every fifteen minutes between Wattsville and Santa Cruz. So that's a huge increase in service than what we had previously. The Route Two is every thirty minutes, and the Route Ninety X, which is the express route on Highway One is every 30 minutes. So there's eight buses an hour between Watsonville and Santa Cruz, which is a lot more than we've had in the past couple of years. And then the item on the agenda is about a grant application that we're working with uh, the Regional Transportation Commission on to fund, to fully fund all of the rapid corridor uh, bus stop um, and other improvements to improve travel time and reliability. It won't get it to 35 minutes. That, I'm not sure where that came from, um, but it will, it's projected to reduce travel time by up to 25 to 40 percent on the corridor, depending on direction and time of day, um, which is it's about a 15 minute tra travel time saving. So we should get it between 50 and 60 minutes, I'll say, depending on peak direction and travel. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? OK. Saying no, no. Was, what, just oh, just sorry. good job. I uh, <laughs> forgot on the bus rodeo. Uh, everybody yes. was wow, a lot, lot more people participating, which is cool. Um, and just I know a lot of work, and it was great to be a part of it. It was a lot of fun. It was, yeah, good job. Everyone yeah, still want to drive the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to have missed that this year. I hope there's uh pictures or videos or both. <laughs> Oh, right. was the fastest driver. <laughs> you were? No, oh, I was like, that's <laughs> <laughs> not the most accurate. <laughs> okay, we're going to go uh, now to item six oral and written communications to the board of directors. Did we receive any written communications? Okay, so we'll go now to oral communications. Good morning, welcome. <laughs> They have thought I would share with you my firsthand experience of seeing the safety training and procedures in action. So yesterday, I was on a prayer cruise when after picking up the third passenger for the ride I was on, I then started making this really loud, strange, never heard by anybody on the van, beeping noise. At first, the driver had no idea what it was. And after five minutes or so, walking around the van, confirming all the doors were completely shut. Turning the van off and turning it back on again and looking around some more, everyone was like, huh, that's an annoying sound. The driver then called into dispatch, which also had no idea what the sound was from, as it was not accompanied by a particular light or anything going off on the dashboard. <sighs> so we were at a stand still while dispatch contacted the mechanics and tried to arrange for a different van to, to come get us. Meanwhile, the driver kept trying to figure out what it was. And well, sort of the shorter version is he determined it to be a, lo a loose wire and, he, and that everything on the bus, except maybe one system the wire was supposed to be working for, was in good working order. So with the okay of dispatch, we were on our way. Loud beeping noise and all. I came to understand that the plan was for the driver to drop all of us off at our assigned stops then take the van to the mechanics or the yard and swap it for another van. So that all ended well. Then in the afternoon, you know, after I already went over the hill and back to do my business from there, I took a number one route to go to Beverly's. And then from there, move on to my Thursday night knitting group over at IHOP. When? While stopped near tra stopped in traffic near the staff of life in Soquel, I heard this thud. Then the driver says, that guy just threw something at the bus. And he broke a mirror. So 
So the driver called it into dispatch when like 60 seconds later, there was this really loud bang on the window next to me. And the driver says, he's still throwing things. Hold on, I need to move. So he pulls up next to Burger King. Then the driver handed out forms for us to fill out and spoke with this dispatch some more. When a few short minutes later, the guy came walking up towards the bus, apparently with things in his hand. So the driver told dispatch, I gotta move again. Then by the time the bus was at the next light, the driver confirmed with dispatch that the bus was still drivable as the only, only the small mirror on the bottom of the big one was broken. And they, and they made a plan for the driver to switch buses apparently in Watsonville. But that's not all. As the bus approached the Soquel and Frederick stop, we see the same guy walking up to the bus stop. So the driver stopped in front of the bus that was already there. And well, very, very long short story shorter, it was there where the police and a supervisor roll up on scene and eventually we were on our way. During both incidences, the drivers remained calm, which trust me could not have been easy because the beeping noise on the van was very loud and not all the passengers on the bus were calm. However, in the end, all of the staff involved followed safety procedures and the only thing hurt was a van and a bus. So the training and procedures in place worked like they're supposed to. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a month already. And I didn't come to teach you guys up today. Good morning, board members, as well as whoever else is doing this. Uh, first, I'd like to ask if there's been any progress made in acquiring some kind of bathroom for your customers. You kind of groups. Okay, before some people take medication, you're on the bus hour 10 minutes, you got to go to the bathroom. I particularly don't want to pay for urinating in public. And I don't want to wear a diaper. Okay. This seems to be fixed and they both push their mind together with legitimate concern and it's fixable. How about the bus stops? Got all the little things removed. Rain's coming up. That'd be nice to drive. Wait for the bus to come. Uh, you think you would bring a new one? You take the old one away. <laughs> That'd be nice to have those. I also question why drivers are not allowed to use their first name in a society where people are getting further and further away. You see somebody all day long and you're riding the bus. Hey, Art, how you doing, Art? You know, even AA, you got an Art B or whatever. It'd be nice to have you do away with that. It's kind of like, there's my number, you know? Sadly, we got some bus stops that are situated where people park, especially on Lincoln Street. And some of the drivers don't want to pull over and hit the brakes. So you got to go further up until you find a spot. That's sad. Maybe we can get some of the places relocated or get them marked off. One big concern that this man has is securing funding with the tax increase that I hear is going to hopefully come so that all these productive uh, things that you've done aren't a waste. So what are we doing to promote it? How, how are we whipping the community into supporting this tax increase so some drivers don't lose their job. Some people left their jobs to come here for a better job. I hate to see people lose their jobs. You know, look at, look at Trump and what's your name? They're going wild at it. Now's the time to start thinking about that. I would also recommend that anybody that sits on this board should ride the bus. Predestined route once a month or twice a month or bi-monthly by somebody so that you get to know and bridge the gap between the drivers, the board, and especially your patrons. It'd be nice to know that I don't know what's going on. There's a lot more than this in the room right here. These drivers are, are babysitters, teachers, counselors. They know a lot of the people on a first name basis and they, they, they know they make their day. Some drivers greet you with a smile and then they drive you around a little while, you know? I'd like to see some of your board members take some concern in. I gotta catch another bus this evening 
get back to Watsonville. Thank you, and I will be here next month. God bless Thank you. you. Any further public comment? Hello. Hello, Eduardo Montesino. I just want to, you know, we're coming out to the, almost the end of the year, and I just want to encourage support and think about, you know, um, like the RTC and what Metro used to do is uh, um, have board meetings and 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 di and different council chambers, whether it's Watsonville, Capitola, Santa Cruz, or in Scotts Valley, um, because it provides, you know, um, a less barrier for people to uh, to join the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Any further public comment? Okay. Seeing none, we will bring it back to labor organization communication. Good morning. I'm Olivia Martinez. I'm the Region 2 Director for SEIU. Um, I'm also one of your stakeholders since my husband and daughter were with us. Monthly pass for them. Uh, so we have a couple of concerns whether this board is committing a Brown Act violation for the following reason. The last board meeting we were here and there was a um, action you took to make sure that the management um, salary was going to be added to this um, agenda. That's on page 35 of the minutes. And so we have a couple of questions is why wasn't the wage study presented on this agenda? Second, why not going to the whole board according to the motion instead of an HR standing? So you didn't, in your board action, you didn't say that you were going to take it to HR's um, committee. You said you were going to bring it here. Um, why is there a delay in presenting if everything is already done? So we are actually consulting with our law because what we read in, in terms of the Brown Act, Brown Act is that the Brown Act is designed to ensure that public has adequate notice of what will be discussed at a meeting. So if a board makes a motion to put something on the next agenda, the public has a reasonable expectation that will be discussed at this meeting. You did not do that. And so we are asking that you look at that. Um, because we are consulting with our attorneys, whether this is a broad, broad and violation. You have a practice with our um, salary studies, and it's been in existence for a really long time. And our members are concerned whether you're hiding something as to the management wage study. Um, any salary has to, any wage increase or change in title requires some kind of study. And it seems that management here has not done that study and perhaps has just made the increases. So we want to make sure that you're following the same rules you follow with your workers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay. Uh, before we move on, can we get um, comment from our legal about the potential suggestion of a Brown Act violation? So I'm not aware of the facts around this particular situation, so I don't think I can feel comfortable saying at this moment, but it's absolutely something we can take a look at and we'll go back to you. I'm aware that what's been described as a brown act violation. Okay, thank you. Answer and confirm. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to additional documentation to support existing agenda items. Anything additional? Okay. All right, we're gonna move now to our consent agenda. All items appearing on the consent agenda are recommended actions, which are considered to be routine and acted upon as one motion, unless uh, there is a request to move any items from consent to our general agenda for further discussion. Are there any board members that would like to move an item? Yeah, I'd like to move 9.8, please. Okay, we're gonna move 9.8, and we will bring that to item, We'll do that right at the beginning of the regular agenda. So we'll make that item 10 now and, and everything else will just move down, move down an item. Okay, do we have any public comment on the consent agenda? Seeing none. Uh, okay. Did you catch the motion in second? I didn't catch the second. Oh, Russian. Okay. Ask the members of the public. I did. Yeah. Um, okay. Do we? Okay. So we need a roll call vote. Director Brown. Aye. 
Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Newsom. Aye. Director Siegler. Aye. Director Kibros Carter. Aye. Director and Director Rockton. Aye. All right, thank you. Okay, so we are going to go back now to item uh, 9.8 that was pulled from our consent agenda. Uh, consideration of award of contract to CFM advocates for federal legislative representative services not to exceed $239,151. Um, Director Dutra, do you want to start uh, with your comments? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. I have questions as well. Um, so I read the staff report on this and um, I was, and there were a lot of, to me, um, still questions to be answered. Um, what, it, it didn't explain what the um, other people came, the other groups came in at when they came for cost and items. It kind of just gave a, a ranking of what staff felt um, without really giving a backup of how they got to that, to that conclusion. So um, when it, so when it comes to cost, I'd like to know, like, was the, 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 um, the award which staff is wanting to give out today, um, were they the, the least expensive or how did they fall with, with cost? They were the second, I believe, second least expensive. So uh, uh, capital, ed, capital Ed was uh, the least expensive on there, um, mostly by uh, CFM. Closely, so what like what are we talking about? Uh, I believe it's uh, I believe it's six hundred dollars a month. I think is the difference. One was six thousand so and one was sixty six hundred. So for a three year contract, that's about twenty one thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, I, I don't have my calculator in front of me. So well, six hundred times 12 is 7,200 times three would be 21,000, around $21,000, right? Yeah, probably, yeah. Um, that's a significant amount. Uh, but uh, was there a reason why you decided, because I've been you know, working on this board with a couple other members for a long time. Capital Edge brought us out of a really um, dark time on this, on this, in this um, organization. Uh, they really helped us get grants. I've been to DC several times um, and worked with them along with um, Mr. Rockin. And I don't know if else is on the board that I went with um, as well, but we were able to get um, new funding for buses. So I'm just kind of curious why, uh, what what made you guys believe that this new organization can do better than where what's already been done and with, with what um, Capital Edge is doing for us now? So through the, the scoring process, uh, when you look at the the application that we received, um, you know, honestly, capital edges was really uh, sparse. Uh, they didn't uh, submit a really good application. Uh, they, I think maybe they were leaning on the history that they had. They didn't submit all the documents um, that were required on there or requested, I should say. Um, you know they they were ranked number three out of the out of the four uh, respondents. Okay. Um. Okay. So, but what were the, what were other factors that were brought into this ranking besides uh, cost? Yeah, the categories. Uh, let's see here. Categories uh, were qualifications and experience. Um, oh, I see staff. that. I'm looking at that now. Uh, so, okay. what does key staff mean? Uh, looking at the staff that would be involved. So, for instance, uh, one of the uh, respondents, uh, they they have a real deep pool of. Uh, of people that work for the organization. And I think looking at which staff would actually be a part of, of the team that would work for Metro on there. And so looking at their qualifications uh, for each of the staff members and what experience they have. 
with capital edge, we were getting pretty much, we were getting treated as we, we knew exactly we had one person that was working with us, giving us a lot of attention. So you're telling us now we're going to be getting an array of different staff members working with us and we're not going to have the commitment of, so we'll just kind of be like a number. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. That was what the category was uh, looking at. So, okay. And the, um, and the people that that were made that made up this um, committee that that looked over this, what, what departments were they coming from? How did you choose uh, them? They came from uh, communications and marketing, uh, from uh, planning and innovation, uh, from finance, and from operations. And you were the fifth? And I was the fifth. Okay, that's that's fine right now. I'm curious to see if anyone else has any other, other questions or concerns. Thank you. Uh, Director Rockin. Um, I'm kind of loath to second guess a process that I wasn't part of, which is fine. I wasn't sure. Of it. And just sort of saying, like, you know, we really. We've really been well, as Jimmy was suggesting, really been well served by Capital Edge. I'm a little nervous about starting with a new group, and I don't know much about and giving them a three year contract. So I, I would be a lot more comfortable if we were able to perhaps have. I mean, I, I don't think I can just sit here and say, you know, ignore what the committee and all of its process to, had took place. But I'd like the idea of maybe giving a one-year contract, see how they perform, because I know the capital age has done a good job for us. And then, you know, we'd be in a position to, at that point to be able to go out to bid again if we have problems or other kinds of issues. I'd feel a lot more comfortable with that. I don't feel comfortable just saying, well, I know capital age is great, and therefore I'm going to ignore everything the staff did in the whole process. <laughs> that, that seems, I'd like, much as I might be tempted to do that, I think it's not appropriate, but I do think that I'm much more comfortable as possible to do it with a one-year contract that we can then, you know, get out of it. it. Turns out this group doesn't. They did great in the interview and with their application. Let's see how they do on the ground with Congress um, and with our representatives and those kinds of things. So I, I, I'm I'm going to wait. Well, I'll make a motion now. That people can speak to it. I'll see if it fails and fail. But that we we move to that process that we actually amend our contract to be a one-year contract possible renewals, but it's possible for us at that point to end the contract if it's not working out to our satisfaction. Um, that's my motion. Otherwise, approving this, um, and um, that's it, basically. If it gets seconded, we'll have a discussion of it. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? I just have some comments, too. Okay, I need a second, though, before we move on with discussion or else. Motion I'll back in there. Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. I saw a director, Kalantari Johnson, had her hand up, and then we'll come to you, Director Lynn. Um, thank you. Yeah, and and I wasn't sure actually because do we get public comment on we this? We will go to public comment before? before there's any vote on the yeah. Um, I, I share the same concerns and had similar questions as Director Dutra. I did have an opportunity to talk to you, Corey, directly about this. Um, you know, the, a process is a process. Um, I do, and I share this with Corey. I think one piece that. Um, I see is missing in the evaluation criteria is uh, knowledge, regional knowledge and partnership, um, mm -hmm. because I know that Capital Edge um, works with the city of Santa Cruz, I believe the city of Watsonville and um, some kind of water district perhaps. Um, so that's a piece of the evaluation criteria that I would like to see moving forward. Um, I, I, I agree with Director Rotkin that, you know, when we have a process in place, we should honor that. And so I'm also hesitant to just kind of scratch it all and, um, think this may be a good direction is to give it a try for a year and then to come back to it. But also curious to hear what other directors thoughts are. Director Lynn? Very similar uh, concerns. I, I I also spoke with Corey and uh, I don't like second guess and hire him to make decisions. But I do I do have concerns that the uh, Capital Edge has done some really good work with us. And as, as uh, Shepard said, the relationship should be one of the things that we look at as far as their um, having that, having, I think, a, a regional foundation to be able to support. And so that's one of the things that has been 
valuable throughout the county and they've done some good work. So um, I think the compromise suggestion is, is a good one, but hopefully for future scoring, I'd like to see that encouraged. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I'm concerned and I have all the respect for the committee that did this and our uh, chief. I'm really concerned uh, because of what's been mentioned, the familiarity with uh, uh, representing the county, the city of Watsonville, with the Santa Cruz, the Gulf Creek Water District, and all. And of course, with anything, the success rate we've had in the Catholic Ridge, I've, I've been very pleased with what we've done. I've been back to D.C. Sprunken, and we went into the Trump Tower for lunch one time. He didn't want to go, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have the picture. I have the picture. For us. <laughs> you guys promised it wouldn't taste big old. I know this is no joke in there. I, I, just to, uh, but I am concerned, and and I I appreciate the idea of uh, the proposal for three years and up to nine years. Uh, that just doesn't fly with me at all. I I uh, I think the amendment is. Is uh, improves it. I'm not sure that I'll be voting on it to uh, change, but and I just want to make sure that it's not a reflection of any of our staff or our, our general manager. Uh, that uh, just that I think we've been served well, and I'd like to continue to work at. Just, I, just one thing. I know one of the things uh, was mentioned that in the past, uh, Chris was um, meeting twice a month. And and uh, in with prior CEO, and I know Corey has not had that same connection to that same outreach, but I think that would be something too that we set standards on what we expect, whoever it is that they are meeting, uh, at least at least monthly, if not because so much changes. So what whoever we go with, and that's something I think that that is important to be involved in the contract is how long or or at least not, not necessarily the contract, but something set forth at the beginning of an agreement that there's a pattern in meetings and, and we're getting the feedback because I know in the past, Chris would come, both of them would come a couple times a year and you know, in person or COVID, but in person reports. And that that was very valuable. So. Any other comments? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a little more detail on what's been said. Um, Director Calendari Johnson, your regional knowledge is definitely helpful. Um, and I mean, just I, I can understand why maybe their application uh, for capital is a little sparse because, in some ways, the accomplishments do speak for themselves. I mean, over $20 million for uh, phase three of the Highway One project, zero emission buses, uh, directly related to this agency, uh, tens of millions of dollars in low interest loans for the Soco Creek Water. District to build a pure water SoCal facility uh, and hundreds of millions for the Pajaro Levy project. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have a very deep relationship with them today. And um, maybe it, uh, to some extent, goes without saying. <laughs> um, I'm not familiar with Capital Ed with Metro. And I think that. It's great that they have this regional knowledge, mm -hmm. and I think it is important to add it to the criteria the next time you do that. Having said that, we're a transit agency. And so the, the federal level, you know, transit that an organization is primarily focused on transit isn't a bad idea. And I just want to kind of keep that in mind as we consider this in the future because yes, it's great that they've presented all these different local agencies and it, it's it's valuable. I don't know if it should be the determining factor. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I, I do share the concerns also though about the um, experience in the community and the ability to see a broad overview of projects that are happening within the county and other cities. And I feel like that gives kind of an opportunity to see how agencies like ours could apply for grants or receive funding in partnership with the cities or the county based on what, what projects they're working on. So, um, you know, if we move forward with the uh, motion that has been made, I think uh, CFM will have big shoes to fill. And 
I understand that following an RFP process and the uh, process that was done in the decision making that we do have legal requirements of how we move forward that also need to be considered in terms of um, how we move forward here today. But um, I will leave my comments at that. And if there's no further, yes. Yes, go ahead. I think people make a good point about the regional connection, but I want to say, at least from my concern, the main one is my experience of going back several times to Washington, D.C., and the connections that their capital age had. I don't, I don't know about the other companies. But um, other than Capital H connected us with congressmen, Republican and Democratic, in a way that allowed us to get. Um, we, we've got a lot more money than our um, fair share as a small community for transit. I'm not talking about the city or the county or anything else. Um, we just, I mean, people have been incredibly impressed with how much this little district has managed to pull. And, and that's, and Capital H played a key role in that. They set up the meetings for us um, with various representatives from the Senate and the House uh, that really were effective. They were able to succeed, not, and not just our local representatives at the time, Sam Farr and, and Diane uh, Feinstein, but you know, some of the uh, persons from Shelby's representatives from Alabama and whatever. And had clearly they had a connection with those people that was well respected and we, we got a really good hearing went back there. So it's that that's really that experience for me that makes me, you know, nervous that a new group might not do as well for us. And, and to Jimmy's point about, you know, bringing the bringing the bucks home. Uh, that, that's really what's sort of motivating me. And so and my view is, I mean, if this new group does a great job and delivers trips and stuff, then that'll be great. But I want to have some ability not to find ourselves you know, as Bruce points out, you know, a nine-year contract that, that uh, we're not stuck with nine, but even three years if it's not working out well, because we, we do have a track record. And to me, that's kind of a pretty important factor. As I said before, to, to Bruce's point, um, as much as I'm willing to say no, I don't want to vote for this or something, I, I want to come up with this alternative because I think you've got to do something to respect the process our staff is involved in here and not just ignore everything they want to sort of judge these things. And so it's, it's very possible that Capital H didn't put the effort into the application that they should have I went on either side, and I don't know what that was like and what's happening there. But I feel strongly that Cap I know Capital H can do this job and find out whether it's a good candidate within a year in that position. Can I get a clarification on the motion I seconded? Um, is it to come back in a year with, with um, what are we doing in a year? It's a one-year contract and we can reopen it. That's what we can either decide to exchange. And we're going to decide that we're going to open up again this capital H along with whatever, whatever other companies can, can apply for it and be in a position to make another choice at that point. Yeah. Okay. That was my understanding, but I wanted to make sure. If it, <clears throat> if it isn't approved, what happens next? If it isn't approved today, we'll have to entertain a, another motion. So the options really are the motion on the table, which I understand to be a one-year contract with options to extend, which will then come back to the board without understanding it or consideration if it's in Metro's best interest or the agency could make the decision to ultimately cancel the solicitation and reissue. But there, you know, Alternative options going outside of the process as well to identify the car during the mm -hmm. Well, you could just get the whole thing and start the process over again. So that's what we said. Yeah. Leave it running. Okay, if there's no further comments from the board, we will take this to public comment now. Hi, my name is Olivia Martinez. So I was actually reviewing the staffing um, profiles of both agencies. And one of the concerns that we have with employees is that uh, Capital Edge actually has more diversity in their staffing versus the CFM. Uh, they have no diversity in their staffing. And that's a concern when you are actually working with a community, such, such a community diverse like Santa Cruz County, that I think you should put it into place. You also have a history with Capital Edge. I'm wondering whether you're going to be spending more money with CFM and why is that? Um, with already capital edge is actually working in your favor. I think these are things that you should consider. 
Um, our members have a concern about that. You spending more money towards a um, agency where you don't know whether they're going to provide you the same benefits that you have with Capital Edge. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, we, we, you know, I've been here for a, a little long and I've worked with Capital Edge uh, throughout and they've been wonderful. And that's one of the biggest reasons why the city of, uh, of Watson required their, their services because our, our, you know, our agency or the capital wasn't uh, functioning very well, not getting meetings, uh, you know, with uh, when we're up there. So we decided to go in RFP, and one of the uh, the the highlights was Capital, um, because they they provide such good services for our community regionally, and and just um, getting getting resources to work. Yeah. Any further public comments? Okay. Hi, welcome, Benjamin Pinka. Um, I just was curious if it would be reasonable or timely to have the committee uh, consider all of these new details and uh, um, in respect to their process, um, see if they would come to the same conclusion. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further public comment, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, and just if if possible, I think it is important to address um, some of what's legally required of us, if that's possible, um, about kind of after an RFP and the process of ranking and whatnot, um, what the kind of legal aspects are of going from an agency that was first choice, skipping over second, and then going back to the third. I think that's something that I think needs to be heard just on for to be on the record. And then the idea of um, once a process is done, a committee going back and saying, well, now there's new criteria that we didn't have originally, and then re-ranking, uh, if there's any legal ramifications to those kind of things as well. Is that something that you can speak to sure. today? Okay, sure. thank you. So I think in both of those cases, we're really understanding that this is a process where we set out the rules. Metro issued an RFP that laid out the rules for how we were going to evaluate proposals, what Metro was going to consider, the process for it, the weighted rankings for each of those criteria. And anytime that an agency is taking actions that are outside of those set rules, then that action is subject to challenge. That's a risky proposition. So in this case, what we would, the first question you have is whether since Capital Edge was ranked third, the board could effectively leapfrog one and two and go to three. And I think as I've said, and as other folks have identified, that's a very risky proposition. It's not clear there is anything that I've heard that is biased or any true mistake that would warrant a change in the action in that way. The board could absolutely choose to modify the recommendation as the motion sets out. The board could not um, proceed with this contract, which is always within the board's discretion. But the proposition sort of moving around the process is, I think, in my estimation, very risky. Additionally, going back, adding new criteria at this stage, as that same thing, changing the rules after the fact is risky and subjects the agency to challenge. So I think of the options that are before the board, the amended action, consideration of the existing action, those are the two paths that I think are most legally advisable and outside of that there is significant risk of challenge. Thank you, I appreciate I appreciate that um, clarification. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Director Boudreau. Thanks. Um, so a couple of things, I actually, you know, I, I do appreciate the comments about, the, you know, he's re the, the regional knowledge is really important. I think that people who know, um, you know, our district, it's it's imperative. Um, they if they know the people that live in the district, I, you know, I, 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 I and not that <laughs> I'm sitting here and I'm like, I'm listening to some people saying, and when I say some people, I'm, you know, the attorney that just said it was risky to um, I don't know, second guess the committee. I mean, I'm not here to rubber stamp what the organization has to say. My job is to take in the information and make the best decision that I feel is going to be for the organization. Though I do appreciate the committee and all the hard work that they put into it. 
at city council levels, we do the same thing. I mean, maybe other cities just agree with everything and approve what the uh, management brings to them, but you know, we don't. We we send a lot of things back, and so as I look at this, I see a commit a com a, a um, company, Capital Edge, that has done very well for us. They are they know um, our region. And the committee that brought something, they brought us a three-year contract with a nine-year extension that would be amended. So it's so right there alone, just even amending it says that we can we can we can make changes. So I, I don't if if so I don't understand what part is risky. Um, is it just going to a completely different person um, organization, or is it just even amending a committee's um, uh, recommendation? So um, in, in my point of view, I, I feel we can do whatever we want. We're the board and we should be doing what's right for the organization. Um, and because Capital Edge has been doing a great job and they have gotten us a lot of resources and they're regionally, you know, they have a regional foundation here um, so much that as Eduardo Montesino just said, we we hired them to represent the city of Watsonville. Um, that I think that that has a lot of weight, and 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 this is nothing to do against the committee. It's just I'm taking in the information that I have, that I know, that I've seen over the past decade of working in this organization, and it worries me to go on to a new organization that is going to be much bigger. We're not going to get. I don't think we're going to get the more one-on-one -on -one, um, treatment that we've been getting and the specialized treatment that we've been getting with Capital Edge. Um, and so, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's going to be the board's decision, but I, I'm just saying that how I personally feel, um, you know, moving forward, I will not be supporting um, the motion. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. So I let me speak from the standpoint of, of the CEO. I've been here six months. And the communication that I've had with Capital Edge at this point is uh, a Zoom call in the first couple of weeks I was here, and then they emailed a couple reports. Uh, I've had no other communication whatsoever with Capital Edge. So we've been paying our monthly retainer for them for nothing. Uh, maybe, maybe the funds that Metro is paying is going to support the work that Capital Edge is doing for other organizations in the in the county I, I don't know I can only speak from my experience I can tell you that uh, the the top candidate CFM they're not a large firm uh, we would be uh, working with uh, their president I don't know the founder of the organization Joel Rubin uh, this organization is actually responsible uh, for uh, the IIJA package, um, part of the bus coalition. They were the, the lobbyists for the National Bus Coalition, which uh, hit the hill very hard uh, in meeting with uh, legislators from across the country in every state, uh, trying to push additional funding for buses, not for rail, but for buses, so that we could get back to that level that we need, because that funding was gone for many years uh, with the with the FAST Act uh, in 2012, it all kind of went away. Uh, so in my mind, uh, CFM has actually been, been responsible for the funding that's been available for agencies to go after uh, it through this transportation package. Uh, I had worked with uh, CFM when I was in Washington State. Uh, they were Super helpful in helping me write a grant and helping us win a, a grant for buses for the agency that I was with. Uh, I've had a good working relationship uh, with Joel, and I have full confidence in his ability to to do and represent Metro, uh, you know, uh, at a very high level. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I wish that the my uh, experience with with capital edge had been different and that it uh, had been what everybody else is talking to but it, for me it has not been thank you 
Any other comments? Just one part of that I think needs whoever set to set set stand set. I mean, uh, whoever comes on, they should be meeting with you regularly. They should be, and that's us asking them, what are, or sharing our expectations. So um, that I think something I mean, whoever we need to make sure that that's. You, you, that we're getting the representation we're paying for. And in my experience, if we've set that, Kept Lynch would have met it, you know, but um, from now on for whatever happens, that needs to be part of whoever it is that they are meeting with you a couple times a month or whatever that is, whatever, on a regular basis. And if they're not, then that needs to be addressed too. So. All right, if there's no further comments from the board, uh, we do have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Regarding first of the amendment, a motion, right? Yes, the motion that you made. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. there wasn't a main motion. And there was only one motion. So my motion is my motion. 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 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Director Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. Director Dutra? No. Director Colentary Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? No. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Key Rose Carter? No. And Director Rockton? Aye. All right. Thank you. We're going to go back now to our regular agenda, item 10. And we'll start with presentation of employee longevity awards. And we have Several. Uh, we have what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine employees that have been here for 20 years and one that has been here for 40 years. So, congratulations to all of these employees. We have for 20 years, we have Esmeralda Arias, Paul Camacho, Miguel Esparcega Jr., Alma Gutierrez, Robert Maldonado, Luis Rocha. Brenda Roman, Daniel Zaragoza, and Israel Zaragoza. Congratulations to all nine of you. And for 40 years, we have Mario Espinoza, 40 years with Metro. Congratulations. And I believe we have Daniel here with us. Yes. <laughs> Come on up. Uh, a bio for Daniel that I uh, like to read. Uh, celebrating your 20th year with the agency. Uh, Daniel began his career at Metro as a bus operator in both fixed route and paracruise. From the beginning, Daniel has been an asset to the agency, working as a representative for the union and promoting the supervisor and assistant manager for Paracruise. Daniel was promoted to manager of Paracruise and most recently was promoted to deputy director of operations overseeing both fixed route and paracruise. During the time of transition, Daniel stepped up to the plate and was interim CEO for Metro. Daniel's communication skills allow him to create positive relationships with internal and external staff. He is looked to as a mentor to many, looked to as a mentor for too many and a resource for his direct reports and the executive team. Daniel's department faced the biggest challenge during COVID-19 and he answered the crisis by creating alternative schedules for both fixed route and paracruise. The result of the innovative idea allowed Metro to still provide service to their most vulnerable clients. During the fires and floods, Daniel and his team provided emergency service to Santa Cruz residents. Daniel enjoys spending time with his family and he is a big sports fan, including soccer and Dodger baseball. Uh, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading what's on the table. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Daniel provides a willingness to go the extra mile, and he has the brightest smile and a good word for everyone. Congratulations, Daniel, on your 20-year anniversary. Congratulations. It has been a pleasure working with you for the you. short few years that I've been on the board, but I'm sure uh, everyone has worked with you in the last 20 years, which you're most intimate. Oh, Thank picture? You. All right. Thank you. Judges, any comments? Just a couple. Okay. <laughs> no, I just want to thank you for this. Um, 
Whoever wrote that bio, I owe you lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have. <laughs> but um, I mean, 20 years, I've held numerous positions. I, I loved every minute of the time that I've been here. Um, I get to serve my own community. I, I get to work with great people every single day. Um, so I'm going to keep on doing this until I stop enjoying it. Thank you. Thank you. And if there are any um, other employees that are being recognized for their employee longevity today, if they feel if they're here and would feel comfortable standing or raising their hands so that we can recognize them. Uh, first of all, public speaking is not my strong point, so that's better go with me. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Judy Souza. She's not with us anymore, but if it wasn't for her, I would be here today. And if you've met her, you know that she's a really, she was a really kind-hearted, sweet, understanding person. And I owe a lot to her for giving me a chance here. And also, um, they say that it says work, that work if you enjoy what you're doing. And I love what I'm doing. So, yeah, I'm just keep on going until either my health hopefully doesn't deteriorate or although it's time to go. And also, um, we have a private joke between me and Eduardo that you know, he, uh, he uh, posted some strings to get me out of a uh, round tree. I don't know if you know what round tree is, but I don't want to get into that. But <laughs> so he gave me a chance of that. And also, I want to say um, thank you. You to all. I'm a physio artist. I'm the first point in the morning, and they have the utmost respect for me, and I appreciate that. And and I try to do as much as I can for them to make their job easier in the morning. But I'm the first point, and in return, they help me out a lot. So, and I thank you all also for this warm and um, applause and recognition. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to say a few words? Hi, my name is Brenda Roman. And I just want to say a few words. I'm kind of like shy to speaking public. I want to thank Daniel for being a great boss and always having his door open to all of us that needed or wanted any issue at all. And to you guys that make um, this possible because our clients really appreciate it. You probably don't hear it enough, but they're so grateful for Paracruz door to door service. I know they they appreciate the drivers and like our you know clients really um understand that we're doing the best we can as drivers, but it's a whole team behind, you know, mechanics, management, everything. And I just wanna thank you guys and also just acknowledge my coworker driver that would have been here today. 20, 20 years too, Jaime Perez that lost his life three years ago in COVID. And he was always on point on there for everything, emergency, volunteering for everything. And he would have been here today and he passed away on September 2nd of 2021. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. People in the room here. My name's Robert Maldonado. Uh, working for Metro for 20 years. My first two years, Terra Cruz. When I first started, wasn't easy at first, but we had a bunch of good people that really worked hard and got the job done. Then I'm built a uh, big out, new experience, great people, great supervisors, great co workers. The feeling from Terra Cruz to fix out. Ever is has been like a family to me. Fantastic. Whenever somebody needs help, we're there to help. I got your back, you got my back. And experience has been great. And our, our passengers, 
There might be a couple of bad apples out there, but overall, fantastic people. Fantastic people. See the people same every day. Always have a little conversation. Hello, how are you doing? This and that. And it says family, family feeling. And I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay, Mario. Paul? Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm feeling about a group photo. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Come on, Daniel. All right, Carol, do you want to run again? Get you all front and center. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. What, what? Yeah. We have an action to approve these we initiatives. Agree? I don't believe so. No. no yes. One thing on the uh, comments, um, I think, I don't think it was mentioned, but when we talked about the, the, the driver's uh, paraphrase that were the 20 year character celebration. What is it? Uh, Friday, November 15th, 11 to 2 at the research park in Soquel. I think everybody should know about that if we can be there. Great celebration for 20 years from there. Absolutely. Okay, did you say? Uh, November 15th at, uh, from 11 to 2 at uh, the research 20, 2880 research park in Soquel. Yeah. Any other board comments? No. Okay, we'll go to public comment. You know, I just I really want to thank you know um, uh, the board for honoring these uh, these employees. The, you know, they uh, I've seen them all all throughout the years, um, but they they are the reason why Metro is such a great organization. You know, forty years, you know, doesn't get any better than better than that before I was born. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, it, it, you know, you have you have a driver, you have a pair of cruise drivers, you have a dispatcher, you have a manager. Twenty years is a is a good commitment. Um, you know why I've been successful hiring because of that. You know, is a, you know people say hey, like why do you, they ask us a lot a lot of uh, ask us in an interview, uh, you know what do you like about the job, it's the organization and the, we were able to attract you know uh, so many employees in a short time of event, but it's because of the examples that they see smiley faces they they call uh, for a pair cruise uh, ride they call the dispatcher because they're running late and you know you get the smile uh, the smiley voice from Paul. You know, as a dispatcher, but 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 it's all of it, and we work together. We work as a team, and and we all grown up here. And you know, and it is a a, a true a mental family. So thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we will return. Uh, more on to item eleven, and these are retiree resolutions of appreciation. For Candice Almanza, Jose Leonel Herrera, and Jess Martinez, congratulations. Uh, I feel like I don't have any bios to read. Are any of these uh, folks in attendance? No? Okay, well, let's go ahead and give them a round of applause. So, that's required. It's required. It does. Once, okay, go ahead. Sec. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I'm going to go to public comments. No public comment on this item? Oh, we do have public comment on this item. Hello. Uh, hi, um, Nate Abrego. Um, hey, I worked at Paracruz for 15 years, and I just wanted to say on, on behalf of uh, the two workers there, Candice um, Amansa and Leo Herrera, um, I 
uh, worked with them for 15 years and like just the amount of uh, Candace just last month had her 20 year of recognition just before her retirement as well. And it, I mean, it just goes to show the, the, the longevity of, of people who work here and their desire to, uh, move up in the company or just stay and work with the community. And so it's all about the people and they've all been uh, part of it. Candace was a major, major part of it um, as a, as a scheduler, scheduler uh, coming in with this large group of folks, the, the OGs, the original Paracruz, uh, Paracruz group. Uh, and there's, you know, there. Uh, and uh, I want to thank Brenda for acknowledging our brother, Hyman, who, personified everything that was Paracruz and everything that is Pacho. And he brought that that family um, and just people, you know, he, he, he brought that to, to every day of work. Um, uh, thank you, I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no additional public comment, we're going to bring it back now to item 12, which is our state legislative update. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Yes, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, 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 oh, sorry. Uh, Director Brown? Uh, aye. Director Downing? Aye. Director Deidre? Aye. Director Collins Jerry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Fagler? Aye. Director P. Rose Carter? Um, Aye. Director Rockin? Aye. Great, thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to our state legislative update. Good morning. The Brown Director is going to be with you this morning. I'm Michael Pimentel with Shaw Yard and Tweesh Miles and Lang, uh, your legislative advocate in Sacramento. Uh, now, as I begin my presentation, I want to acknowledge where we are in the year, and that is seeing the end of the 2023-2024 regular legislative session. Uh, that session ended at the end of August. And I'll note, uh, ended in the very uh, final hours of August 31st. Uh, as is usual, we saw that the state legislature exhausted every minute, every opportunity uh, to act on legislation. Uh, in fact, the night was so long that there were, were a raft of bills that were not acted on before the legislature reached the midnight deadline for action. And therefore, uh, several bills became collateral damage uh, due to uh, the gamesmanship uh, in Sacramento and some of the uh, discord that had existed between parties uh, between the two houses. And so at the end of that night of August 31st, uh, we saw the start of what uh, is a 30-day bill signing period for Governor Newsom. Uh, he had ultimately until September 30th uh, to act on all bills that came to his desk in the final weeks of legislative session. And I'll give you a snapshot of what that looked like uh, momentarily. Uh, but what I want to highlight now is that uh, we are in a transitional period. Of course, we've got an election coming up first week of November. Uh, after that election, we'll see that the legislature will reconvene in Sacramento uh, for an organizing session on December 2nd. Uh, that's when they uh, elect officers. A uh, few legislators will uh, introduce bills at that time. Uh, then they'll go back to their districts and then return to Sacramento at the start of January for the true beginning of the 2025-2026 legislative session. Uh, we have here January 6th. Uh, or January 7th, and that's because the legislative calendar for next year has not yet been published. Uh, that's something that we will see after that organizing session, uh, but it's a good bet uh, that comes the 6th or the 7th, we will see uh, legislators reconvene in Sacramento and begin their work for the year. Uh, one thing that we do know is that Governor Newsom will release his budget on January 10th. There is a constitutional requirement uh, that he present uh, his budget no later than January 10th, with every governor that I've seen, they have taken that last day to present their budget. Uh, and what we're going to expect in, in this budget uh, is uh, an update on the state's uh, fiscal picture. Um, I'll note for you momentarily uh, what this year's budget uh, bill brought, uh, some of the areas of risk, some of the uh, areas of opportunity, 
Uh, and here what we'll be getting is the latest financial data for the state uh, as developed by the state's Department of Finance. Uh, so I mentioned bill signing period, a uh, number of bills that were ultimately set to uh, Governor Newsom, uh, over 1,200. Uh, and he signed over 1,000 into law. That means just under 200 uh, were vetoed by the governor. And the primary reason for the vetoes that he issued was the state of the uh, state's uh, budget outlook and also uh, the reality that he and the legislature had just reached the budget agreement uh, to close a budget deficit over a two-year time horizon, which I'll note is an extraordinary thing. Usually we see budget actions uh, take place for a single budget year. Uh, this year, knowing uh, that so many of the expenditures were multi-year in nature, so much of the risk is multi-year in nature, they acted on a two-year bill. I'll give you a bit of details on that in a moment. Um, as I, I go into this item on funding and accountability, I want to start off with big picture. Again, I noted a two-year budget agreement was reached that covers fiscal years 24, 25, and 25, 26. And it includes roughly $47 billion in what the governor would refer to as budget solutions. That means cuts, deferrals, and fund shifts. When I say fund shifts, I mean movement from money in the general fund, expenditures and uh, obligations there into other special funds, uh, things like the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund uh, that is supported by the state's cap and trade program. Now, one of the budget solutions that I hadn't touched on, but that is in, in evidence here, is the rainy day fund. There is a withdrawal from that fund, about $12 uh, billion. Uh, that leaves around $18 billion in still additional capacity between the state's rainy day fund and other reserves to address what may be cyclical downturns, cyclical uh, fiscal issues for the state in years ahead. Uh, but combined, again, we have a two-year budget solution. Uh, that's important because as we talk about in particular, the action the legislature took on transit funding, uh, you know, we have money that is multi-year in nature. Uh, the two-year um, budget bill protects those monies. Again, I'll be going into some details on that in a moment. Uh, so here I'm highlighting the money that was first secured last year by the California Transit Association in partnership with local transit agencies and regions across uh, the state. It's the money that we often will refer to in short form as SB 125. So SB 125 funding to uh, remind you is a package that totals $5.1 billion over multiple years. Now, what I'm highlighting for you here is when I highlighted earlier uh, the fact that there were some funding delays that were actuated as part of the governor's budget solutions, one of the things that we saw was that the appropriation timeline for this uh, money became one year longer. And so initially we had a four-year uh, package of investment uh, that ultimately equated to that $5.1 billion. What we have now is a five-year package of investment. And the two operative changes that I would highlight for you, uh, the $5.1 billion is comprised of two parts, $4 billion for the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, $1.1 billion for the Zero Emission Transit Capital Program. That three years is underlined because it was previously a two-year package of investments. Uh, that five years is underlined because it was previously a four-year package of investments, now five years. What that will deliver to this region uh, over then that five-year uh, time horizon is at roughly $35 million uh, that flows to RTC uh, for pass-through to local agencies. And uh, as a dominant agency in this region, uh, a majority of that money is going to then uh, flow to uh, Santa Cruz Metro for your projects, for your services, uh, to make sure that you have the resources you need to uh, weather um, the, the reality of um, difficult um, uh, fiscal situation for, for agencies uh, like yours, but then also, too, help staff up, staff up for uh, your longer-term ambitions of increasing ridership and improving service uh, for the communities that you serve. Uh, now, I want to highlight for you that uh, the action by the legislature uh, to preserve that funding was in no sense preordained. And one of the things we'd actually seen in April was that Governor Newsom, as he was developing what uh, we refer to as his May revise, his uh, mid-year update to the budget, he put into place a state spending freeze. And that ultimately paused the release of the first year of investment that was secured in 2023. Uh, now that 
uh, elicited a very strong response from California's transit industry, again, helmed by, by the Transit Association. Uh, and what the association did, I'll note, in a separate role, uh, as you know, serve as executive director of that association, we uh, brought together transit agencies, labor organizations, to highlight for the legislature uh, what that pause, which could become a cut, would mean to local transit services at local projects. Uh, and one of the first uh, agency representatives that we tapped as part of that effort uh, and that I did work with uh, very uh, early in his uh, tenure was uh, your CEO, Corey Aldridge. Uh, now, for you all, you're in a unique position. One of the members of your legislative delegation is Assembly Speaker Robert Rivas. He's, of course, a hugely influential figure in the state legislature. Strong need to uh, impress upon him and his office the importance of the investments. And so uh, one of the first things we did, uh, pull together a meeting with Corey, uh, with his counterpart in Monterey Salinas, uh, uh, that would be uh, Mr. Carl Sigoric, uh, to meet with the speaker's office, talk to them about the impacts, uh, talk about the realities of uh, how your investments were intended to flow, which uh, by and large were staffing up, painting uh, jobs uh, that had been uh, uh, extended uh, earlier in the year, uh, and then we worked uh, in concert with uh, Smart TD uh, to make sure that the labor voice was represented within that conversation. Uh, now, with all of these things, of course, it's a chorus of voices that helps get things done. Uh, but ultimately, what was uh, preserved was, again, that funding and then the release of this money. And so what's gone out the door so far? $2.2 billion going out to regional entities across the state. Uh, 40 regional entities have benefited from that uh, investment. Uh, and uh, RTC share uh, was included in that second release that's noted here on August 30th. Uh, now, with the budget action was taken last year, uh, I mentioned that the TRCP investment moved from uh, a two-year to a three-year investment. Originally, that was intended to be a $4 billion investment split across two fiscal years, even split $2 billion, $2 billion. It became a three-year investment, $2 billion, $1 billion, and $1 billion. That additional $1 billion is going to be available uh, for agencies to capture uh, with a release date of no later than April 30th of 2025. And so I wanted to offer here the taking score, what that means in terms of big picture total investment, what has been appropriated today uh, based on the two uh, years of budget actions is roughly, or it is two thirds of the total funding. But of course, appropriating uh, money does not necessarily mean that it's been allocated. So what has gone out the door is 43%. Uh, the remaining balance is uh, about uh, $200 million that has not flown to regional entities based on the first year of investment. And then the additional $1 billion, which has not moved out uh, the door because it was just appropriated. There's some process uh, that needs to be uh, executed on by the regional entities in order to see that money flow. Uh, now, when I was before you earlier in the, the year, uh, I had noted for you that uh, the state's investment did not did not come for free. Uh, the state uh, had a conversation with the industry last year about providing additional investment uh, in operations and in capital uh, and said, as part of this process, what we want to see is reform. Uh, now, the reform framework is one that is being developed by uh, the California State Transportation Agency's Transit Transformation Task Force. Uh, they met first in December of 2023. They've been meeting every other month. Uh, to move forward on a series of recommendations to be delivered to legislature no later than October 31st, 2025. Our uh, most recent meeting was in uh, Los Angeles uh, in August. Uh, the upcoming meeting is going to be uh, next Monday in Monterey. Uh, and the conversation that we'll be having uh, in Monterey will focus on three things. We'll be focusing on land use and housing, uh, improvements that can be made on policy there to further support public transit, uh, transit-oriented development and value capture to support TOD projects around transit, allow agencies to capture more resources to invest in capital development or further operational uh, support, and then finally, first mile, last mile solutions to support public transit. We've got large fixed uh, guideway projects, a larger trunk line projects that may need theater service connecting to it. Uh, but the big picture for all of this is that we are talking about reform that is going to touch all aspects of public transit. I know for you here, one of the big ones, Transportation Development Act reform, uh, recognizing that today a lot of the agencies are still struggling to meet the fare box recovery requirements that are in statute. 
Uh, we've been under some relief uh, that that was afforded by the legislature uh, to engagement from from the transit association that will soon expire. And so what we're looking at is what comes next. Uh, how do we uh, relax some of the strictures that are in TDA? Just recognize we as a state want to invest in public transit. Let us invest in public transit without complication or uh, impediment uh, in doing so. Uh, now, I'm going to close on a few uh, pieces of legislation, a few things that, uh, that were of, of importance, just elevate for, for your, your awareness. Uh, and I'm going to touch on, on two bills. Uh, the first is SB 960 by Senator Scott Weiner of, of San Francisco. Uh, this is a bill that he's been uh, trying in uh, various forms uh, over multiple years, finally got it done. And what it does is it requires uh, the State Department of Transportation Caltrans to develop a transit priority policy and design guidance uh, to support transit facilities and transit operations on the state highway system. And so uh, this has a series of timelines that will be in evidence. Uh, first thing up is the director is charged with developing the policy uh, no later than January 1, 2026. What follows from that is that by uh, January 1st, 2027, they need to set performance measures that they want to meet. They're going to have to also identify the roles and responsibilities under Caltrans. So here we're talking about not just at the headquarter level, but down to the individual uh, districts and units to make sure that we are driving toward the outcomes that are anticipated under this legislation. And then finally, uh, they'll be moving forward with the design guidance. Uh, and that will be by 2028 to ensure that we're making progress on these fronts. Uh, Can you fill that in with some more details so we can understand? What would be some examples of what the goals that you're trying to sort of push this towards? So the legislation was at one point very specific. It got watered down because Caltrans wanted to maintain some discretion as to what those goals might be. But really what we're looking at is potential increase in throughput for uh, transit service, making sure that we're uh, addressing what may be uh, delays in service that are caused by uh, congestion on the state highway system. Uh, we would be looking at safety improvements. Uh, for example, a lot of state highway routes serve as local streets or roads in rural or suburban communities, as, as you know. So um, we would be looking to address some of those things within the structure of the performance uh, measures. Uh, and then what they would be charged with doing more specifically is considering how can you use the state's um, uh, investments uh, for rehabilitation and maintenance uh, to get uh, twin investments that support not just maintenance and rehabilitation, but that also support complete streets elements, uh, uh, public transit elements, uh, to make sure that we're getting greater leverage out of the investments. Can I just sure. uh, expand on that? Me, I think the first bus my shoulder. Um, will that help in this regard? I think to have something in place ready to go. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a good question, and um, very candidly, the topic of bus on shoulder within the Department of Transportation, within the California Highway uh, Patrol, has generally been um, something of a non-starter. Now, granted, you have legislation specific to your district that allows you to move forward with that project, but what you don't have is necessarily the negotiating power to ensure that you're getting a good deal as you're moving through this process. Uh, now, over multiple years, the Transit Association had worked to try to move uh, broader policy forward uh, that further dictated uh, the roles and responsibilities, cost allocation, things of that nature. Uh, that has consistently failed because of opposition from primarily California Highway Patrol. Uh, so to your question, uh, Director uh, McPherson, I think what we would see is probably scant met, uh, mention of bus on shoulder within this framework because some of that tension. Now, I could be proven wrong uh, on that front because of course this is still a developing process, but just knowing some of the tension that exists within uh, Cal SCA's family, which includes Department of Transportation and CHP, I think probably unlikely that we'll see something that will be directly supportive of the work that you're doing. Um, the final mention that I'll, I'll, I'll highlight here though is that Within the industry, there is broad acknowledgement that bus on shoulder has to be something that is contemplated by the state if we're actually going to make progress on uh, improving transit ridership, improving the transit experience. And so there will be the continued pressure. Um, final comment I'll make on this is that 
Um, I'll be having through the Transit Association engagement with Caltrans beginning next week to explore with them what the scope of their policy may be. I, I don't expect to get specifics at that time, but I probably will get at least in general sense. Um, and my my starting position is bus on children to be clearly identified within this policy. Um, dozen other states that do it, doing it for 30 years. There shouldn't be something exceptional about California that we can't can't get on with that type of project. Uh, so the final thing that I wanted to just highlight for you is a bill that uh, relates to uh, your larger ambitions for ZE transition. It's a bill uh, by Senator uh, Ana Caballero uh, from, um, originally from Salinas, now her district includes um, Fresno and other parts of the, the northern Central Valley. Uh, and this is a bill that would establish expedited genetic review for hydrogen production and storage facilities that were direct beneficiaries of CNN. Uh, and, and the goal here is to help uh, expand capacity at the state level, to help increase throughput for that, uh, that uh, fueling type, help decrease costs, and make the technology a bit more viable for agencies to take up. And it's very specifically aimed at supporting the Arches project that was uh, California's successful hydrogen hub project uh, to make sure that that project is delivering on the benefits that were included in the application to DOE and that, again, is able to deliver a billion dollars of uh, federal investment to the state of California uh, that is uh, leveraging billion dollars more in private cap. And so this was a huge win. Uh, I'll tell you, this too was not preordained. It was a very uh, hard-fought uh, discussion within the legislature. Uh, your CEO was uh, very good at engaging on, on this front as well, just recognizing your larger ambitions to get to ZE, reality that fuel costs can be a challenge. We've got to get to production. We've got to get to storage in order to crack that nut on the fuel price. And so at this time, I'm concluding my, my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions, comments that you might have about the happenings in Sacramento over the fun session. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Director McPherson. Yeah, there, there was a time when um, there was a speaker that uh, literally stopped the clock before midnight. His name was Willie Brown to make legislation uh, come through, you know, but uh, those days are gone. Uh, you talked about focusing on, um, I think it was on uh, Senator uh, Wiener's bill on 40 regional entities. Is that RTCs or is that AMBAG? So uh, here, I believe that you're referring to the total investment of SB 125 funds and then the benefits for the 40 regional entities. Uh, in this region, it is RTC that is the receiver of those dollars. And uh, just for a bit of background, when this uh, package of investments was being developed, uh, there was a clear acknowledgement that there wasn't going to be enough funding to satisfy all transit agencies in the state. So directing the money in total to all of the agencies was going to be something that ensured that no one got exactly what they needed to uh, save their services and move major capital projects forward. So the money was directed to the regions instead, so they could go through the hard process of deciding who gets what. Uh, you're in a slightly privileged position here in, uh, in San Francisco. You see that in this, we have a very big con uh, conflict, I'd say, of you know, rail and so forth, and, uh, public transit. Uh, do either of these emphasize uh, metro uh, bus transit versus rail, or is it, do they yeah. get into that? No, it's, it's a good question, and I would say that the legislation itself is uh, generally agnostic in terms of what mode gets invested in. All that said, the structure of the guidelines is very specific that you should be supporting the existing service. And so uh, here just want to acknowledge as a bus operator in operation versus rail that may be forthcoming, a heavy balance is intended to go to those that have services that need to be maintained, services that need to be expanded. Um, final remark though I would make there is that ultimately discretion is at the regional level. So while it's not the case in this region, We've seen um, money being directed toward rail development and capacity at a, at a big level in other regions of the state we have. Um, so, you know, never mind the general guidance that's in the guidelines. Some of the regions have decided where we want to place our stock is in major uh, rail development. This is a case, for example, under TAMSI uh, in Monterey, uh, where we're seeing uh, some uh, investment being used to um, do some planning studies, uh, engineering work. Support eventual rail to that cap. Uh, 
get down the even split between that region and uh, Tennessee. Thank you so much. Sorry, hands up. Oh, sorry. It's Go okay. ahead, Director. Um, so I have a couple questions uh, for you. Um, one is you said that we're going to that over the next five years, thirty five million dollars will be coming into the um, RTC and then being distributed with a majority of the money going to Metro. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, so I don't know if my question so uh, this question is so much for you than it is for staff, but um, are these numbers being used in our budget? Because we do hear a lot of doom and gloom um, with the budgets that we see. And this seems like pretty good news that would maybe make it not so much doom. Touch on that briefly for the transit service, and Chuck, maybe you can talk about the budget. Sure. Uh, so we worked with RTC to direct 28 million of that funding uh, toward Rematch Metro to both fund service restoration coming out of COVID and the service expansion plan that we're currently putting in place. Um, and then four million we reserved for transit capital improvements, namely that transit signal priority uh, on our major corridors, and that's part of the kind of match and leverage we we put in this. We're putting in this grant that we're working on RTC, this solutions for transit corridors uh, program funding, and then RTC uh, reserved about two million for environmental um, for the rail uh, component, and then they take. One percent, about three hundred fifty thousand for administrate for administering the grant. Um, so, so you're just saying, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're saying that this money was for COVID. But the, from what I'm understanding, this is saying for the next five years forward. Am I misunderstanding what the the thirty five million dollars is for? Yes. Yeah, so Director Dutrell, I'll handle that, that that question. And the money flowed for really two reasons. Uh, one is to help support agencies who are facing an immediate fiscal cliff. Uh, but also to help the agencies with broader recovery and expansion plans. And so there are, are two co-equal considerations within the pot of, of funding, depending on the region, depending on the individual agency and the uh, immediate needs that they have, uh, there is that discretion to apply those dollars where they're uh, most valid, where they're the most useful. Oh, so this $35 million is not a set number coming towards us then? The $35 million is a set formula um, share that you would be getting under RTC. Right. And it says, we used, right, were you the one that gave the presentation? That's correct. And you said use the word majority of it would go towards the Metro. So I just want to make sure that, that, that I mean, we're, we're it sounds great, right? But when we get our budget, it doesn't sound so great. So I'm confused. Like, it, are, is the majority of this money coming in and is it being reflected in our budget or... Is it, as you said, going to different agencies? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take first the, the flow of the money. Uh, as it is first directed from the state to RTC, the pass-through is majority to Santa Cruz Metro. I'm going to uh, uh, defer to John to speak to at what level, and then John can speak to uh, how that money, when it gets to Metro, is being applied uh, between um, the uh, end purposes. Yeah. Uh, so, Director Dutra and others, the, we are applying 28 million of that funding, and so far, two thirds or half? Two thirds has been appropriated, appropriated and right. half has been allocated. Uh, again, towards service restoration and the reimagined metro service expansion. We think that covers, Chuck can chime in, but two to three years of operating expense uh, for that. So, yeah, it does help with. Our budget, our deficit, but it's two to three years of operating expense, one-time operating funding uh, that we're using right now, uh, again for service restoration and expansion. It, but it's reflected in our budget, correct? It is. Yeah. It is. So this, so this is not new money coming in. No. <clears throat> this is actually money already reflected in the budget for two to three years of of service. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's already it's already in our budget. It's already okay. reflected in our budget. Yeah. And so we are seeing through the budgets the doom and gloom of the future for our agency, and, but I do see that there might be um, $2.2 .2 billion, right? And as you just said, um, that is allocated among um, the, they look at to see whether if people are coming towards fiscal cliffs and they help them out. So we, under that theory, would be receiving probably a portion to be helped out, correct? 
So I, I, I want to I, I want to clarify here. So the previous slide that notes the four billion dollars and the one point one billion dollars that totals, of course, five point one. What is directed there is the thirty roughly thirty five million dollars of RTC. What I was noting on the second slide here is of that five point one billion dollars, how much has actually been appropriated? How much of it has actually flowed to the individual regions? And so this is an additive money beyond the 5.1. It is a subcomponent of the 5.1. It's moving out on multiple years. And so what we're providing is an update on how we're making progress toward meeting uh, the full uh, release of that $5.1 billion total. Okay. I, I thank you. I appreciate this, the, this explanation because it, it actually doesn't make, I, I get stressed out when I think about the future of Metro, but I don't feel so bad looking at this now anymore. I feel like, okay, well, money's constantly coming in and we're, we've been, you know, so there's, so I say, thank you for that explanation. Sure um, thing, and then um, my other, I guess, just clarification, I think Bruce talked about it a little bit right now, as well as the bus on shoulder. So um, it's basically the CHP has a lot of um, kind of uh, sway when it, with our legislature. And so they're not big fans of this bus on shoulder, I guess, method. Um, so does that mean that there's basically no funding for that, that they, that they would be supporting the legislature at this time because of the non-support for bus and shoulder? I, I probably wouldn't go that far. I would suggest that there is, um, very little support in expanding bus on shoulder beyond the project that you all are directly overseeing. The why, I, I, why are we like, I, like why does Santa Cruz County see it one way? And the rest it of the is get something different. It is a very unique circumstance. And um, here, I'm going to have to offer conjecture, not direct uh, inside direct knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, but as someone who who's run the last, I think, four uh, pieces of legislation on bus on shoulder, my general perception is that the authorities at Santa Cruz and at Monterey, Salinas Transit secured, simply flew under the radar. It wasn't a big enough topic of discussion. As soon as the industry through the Transit Association scoped it up to talk about statewide authorization that can be negotiated at a regional level, it's at that point that it triggered the interest of CHP. And oh, so okay. the opposition is toward the larger uh, policy. Now, I don't want to speak to uh, any particular negotiations as I don't have uh, insights into how your agency is engaging with CHP, so I don't want to impugn what may be happening here at, at a uh, regional or division level, but certainly at the statewide level, broader authorization generally off the table. So uh, for Director McPherson's question around, you know, could the director's policy that flows from SB 960 speak to Boston Shoulder? I offered some precaution there, uh, given what we've seen in terms of engagement from CHP uh, on that issue uh, as pieces of legislation have moved forward independently for statewide authorization. Yeah, I don't see why they wouldn't want to, the CHP would not want to work with the uh, Metro Transit agencies on this. I mean, it's not like, you know, they, they we both can share those those lanes, you know. So um, uh, to me, that's, this is just, you know, this is the politics that people hate, just to be honest. I mean, this is, you know, and, um, but it's our job to make sure that we try to make this as smooth as possible. So thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Clarification on the uh, four billion versus the one billion. Yeah. How much of our thirty-four point seven million is in the one point one billion? We got to wait five years for. Yeah, I thought I was under the impression that all of that was coming out of the four billion, and that's why that we mostly budgeted for it over yeah. the next few years with Greenman. It, it, it would be the the twenty percent of that. Uh, Thirty-five million dollars, and so the way that they've run this is it is all all formula on the same formula, and so you can um, break it down in that in that type of way uh, of just considering what's the total and then what's the share of the one point one relative to the total. The big commitment to hydrogen. Uh, how does that statewide viewed uh, in all this? Uh, if you're going that direction, is that good thing, is bad thing? How does that? I would say that, you know, the, the general pers perspective of the state is that one, every agency, as, as you know, have the requirements to reach zero emission by 2040. Um, the state has taken a technology agnostic approach to how agencies get there. 
I think there is a, a clear understanding that agencies based on uh, geography, service territory, et cetera, have to choose a technology platform that's best for them. Um, what the state has so clearly articulated is a strong support in making sure that uh, hydrogen has an ability to have a uh, fighting chance in the heavy duty market. And that is, I think, an evidence in the work that they did to secure the arches money from DOE. And so strong support for that. Um, and I, I would say, you know, uh, now the, the conversation is turning into a bit of a thorny area around uh, hydrogen sourcing and how hydrogen is produced. Uh, but with regards to actual deployments, uh, neither here nor there. Uh, but it is a conversation on broader policy front of are we making hydrogen through electrolysis and splitting uh, water molecules, or are we uh, are we producing it through methane reformation, for example? Other questions? All right, thank you. We will go now to public comment on this item. Okay, seeing no public comment, we will bring it back to the board. Uh, that was just an informational item, so we'll move on to item 13, our federal legislative update. Thanks, Chair Brown. Uh, I think Donna's got some slides, thanks. Uh, it has been uh, it's been pretty quiet here in Washington D.C. Usually, that's the way during election years. Not a ton of legislating gets done, but uh, this year was even uh, less uh, less like less accomplishments uh, than usual. A really, sort of narrowly divided House and Senate prevented a lot of things from happening. Uh, Congress has been in recess for the whole month of August. Was in recess for much of September in, in session for a couple of weeks and then uh, have been out of session this whole month of October as well. Uh, so most of the legislating got done uh, this summer. So I just thought I'd, uh, I'd quickly try to, you know, go through uh, what kind of, you know, happened earlier this year where we were, uh, where we are right now, and then maybe a, a, a short look ahead. So uh, the uh, FY 2024 budget, FY 2024 technically started on October 1, 2023. Uh, but it was only enacted uh, in late uh, March of this year. So five months into the fiscal year, uh, we finally had a, a budget. Uh, the federal transit formula programs that we rely on uh, received uh, a 2.6% increase. Uh, that was uh, baked into that uh, infrastructure bill slash reauthorization bill. So that 2.6 uh, remained there. Uh, I wanted to mention, though, that Metro's uh, allocation uh, was about 4.2% uh, more than uh, the previous year. And uh, sort of uh, that is a testament to, uh, you know, the board's direction and, and the staff's really hard work to uh, maximize the efficiency of your routes. Uh, so now uh, that uh, that STIC program, the Small Transit Intensive Communities uh, program that allows us to get additional formula funding based on our, our, uh, our service levels, uh, now accounts for about half of our about six million dollars a year, half of the the annual formula, and so uh, so uh, again a testament to uh, to this organization's uh, work to create that program and and uh, keep growing it. The competitive programs that we try to compete with the low and no. Uh, uh, emissions vehicles programs, bus and bus facilities, they were funded at those authorized levels that that five-year infrastructure bill uh, put together. Uh, no plus-ups like previous years. In previous years, Congress had added, uh, you know, a few million dollars, uh, in, in some cases, uh, hundred millions of dollars to those competitive programs to allow for some additional uh, uh, money for those comp competitive programs. Uh, and then I mentioned also the RAISE uh, discretionary program did receive a plus up. That's one of the more popular, probably the most popular Department of Transportation program because everyone can apply for it. Uh, it's transit, it's rail, it's trails, it's pedestrians, it's bikes, it's highways. Um, I have a colleague who uh, likens it to uh, applying to Harvard. It's an extremely competitive uh, program, but uh, but robustly funded. And uh, but they that did receive uh, that that plus up this year. Uh, so Congress did sort of recognize the popularity of some of these programs. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the FY 2025 technically should have started on October one. Uh, we do not have an enacted budget. 
Uh, I was talking to someone in a similar a group in a similar uh, fashion a couple of weeks ago, and it came to me that uh, I have two college-age children, and neither of them have been alive to see Congress approve a budget on time for October one. Uh, it's uh, it's become uh, it's become sort of uh, uh, traditional that Congress can't meet that October one uh, budget. Uh, date and so what we are now doing that's that's what Congress spent uh, September a couple of weeks in September trying to do was approving what they call a continuing resolution or a stopgap budget bill to keep the government running at FY24 levels uh, uh, until uh, a new budget is passed. That CR right now goes through December 20th. Uh, it's the hope that Congress will finish that um, uh, that budget before the 20th, but uh, that's not uh, not certain. We kind of have an idea of what the DOT budget is going to look like, even though that final budget is not uh, together yet. Uh, both the House and Senate Appropriations Committees have uh, completed their FY25 uh, budget proposals, and those will stand as the negotiating points as Congress uh, uh, in the next couple of months uh, negotiates that final budget. Um, again, both proposed those authorized levels for the FTA formula programs, and that'll represent about a 2% increase over FY24 levels. Um, the Senate, uh, the Appropriations Committee, does include some additional money for some of the FTA competitive bus programs, about $84 million. Uh, they also propose about $550 million additional uh, funding for that raised discretionary uh, program. Uh, the House uh, has a budget that looks a little bit different uh, than, the, than the Senate. The House Appropriations Committee's budget uh, does cut DOT funding uh, from 24 uh, overall, but the biggest differences in, in the two budgets uh, are with uh, the Amtrak. Uh, they, the, the House uh, suggests some pretty steep cuts to Amtrak. And what we used to call the New Starts Program, the Capital Investment Grants Program, which does uh, light rail projects, bus rapid transit projects, things like that, that would have experienced a, would experience a big cut if the House budget uh, comes to pass. Uh, certainly, uh, as I said, the House and Senate are going to probably try to negotiate that final budget between the November election and December 20th. Uh, they'll probably come back the week after the November election, and the budget will be their uh, really their focus during that that session. Um, but the results of that election could impact uh, the ability to negotiate that final budget if one party believes that they are going to have some more leverage uh, come January when the new Congress is sworn in. They may decide to pause on negotiating a final FY25 budget and say, let's try to you know, get things uh, the way we want them to look uh, in calendar year 25. Um, so we will see. But again, uh, that, that, that December 20th, um, deadline does give you some uh, ability to kind of pressure the uh, members to get things done before the holidays, which they often like to do. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, I mentioned here the uh, FY25 budget really is going to be the focus of this lame duck session uh, in November, December. Um, I also, you know, looking ahead, the infrastructure law slash reauthorization bill uh, last through fiscal year 26. We'll be in, you know, we'll be discussing fiscal year 26 budgets next year. Uh, it's not too early to start these policy discussions and funding discussions for that for that next reauthorization. I think it's probably an open question as to whether the you know really robust funding levels for uh, transit programs and all transportation programs uh, that were part of that infrastructure bill will be the baseline for the next uh, bill or whether they would go back to sort of pre-infrastructure bill uh, funding levels as their baseline and, and, and talking about the infrastructure bill as sort of an anomaly that we needed to do because of the pandemic, things like that. Uh, recent history also says that Congress, again, won't be able to come to an agreement on that reauthorization bill um, uh, in by the end of uh, FY26, and so they'll probably have to do some sort of extensions, uh, similar stop gaps to keep things going while they uh, discuss that. And then, of course, I mentioned a new administration uh, could impact the way that these uh, infrastructure bill programs are implemented in their final years. Certainly, a, a Trump administration would would do things differently than a Harris administration, but a Harris administration may, in fact, do things differently from uh, um, from a Biden administration as well. A lot of the uh, a lot of the policies for these programs are baked into law, but but you can do things. So, for instance, I talk we talk a lot about the uh, that low no program where we got a, a twenty million dollar grant for those hydrogen electric buses. 
Um, right now, Congress says, uh, the law says that that, uh, that at least 25% of that funding needs to be used uh, uh, for the uh, low emissions side of that low no, as opposed to no emissions. And the Biden administration is sort of, you know, hewed to that, but certainly uh, a new administration could conceivably, depending on how they feel about the zero emissions bus uh, programs, could, could increase that amount. The 119th Congress begins in January. There are these two uh, year sessions. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the uh, November elections. Uh, if I if I did, I'd be in Vegas right now, but I don't know. Uh, but what I do know is that the majorities that will come out of this election in both the House and Senate will be narrow. Right now, they're both very narrow. Uh, and so uh, we, we know that, that we will probably be facing the same types of challenges that those narrow majorities provided us uh, over the last two years. Uh, a lot of the leadership will probably say the same, uh, but I, what we, one thing we do know is that uh, the Senate will, uh, will have a new Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, who's been, I believe now, the longest serving party leader uh, in Senate history for either uh, uh, Democrats or Republicans. Uh, he's not resigning from the Senate. He's uh, just resigning in, as a leadership, and so there will be a, 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 an elected uh, competition for that um, uh, come, come in January uh, or maybe later on this year. And then also, um, uh, I think the transportation leadership of these you know, com uh, tra policy committees are likely to stay the same. Sam Graves from Missouri would like to stay chair of the House Transportation Committee. Rick Larson from Washington State would also like to you know, be the top Democrat, so those will probably stay. I mentioned before uh, a, a Harris administration might have some different ideas with regard to transportation. We probably think that that Secretary Buttigieg will uh, will will move on to other things. Uh, should sh even should um, uh, uh, um, Vice President Harris be elected president, um, so we'll probably have a new uh, transportation secretary as well. So. Uh, that was about it. I didn't want to take too much of your time, uh, but I, uh, before I take any questions, I did also want to uh, thank you all for uh, this board for your kind uh, words earlier. Uh, I have uh, been really, really proud and honored to, to serve this agency and to serve you folks uh, for the board. I, I, I saw some news recently about uh, uh, recognizing the, uh, the date of the uh, uh, 89 uh, earthquake. Uh, and that's sort of how our relationship started. I think Director Rock can probably even remembers this, uh, but we were in a sticky situation with FEMA, and we needed to rebuild after uh, after that earthquake. And uh, um, and so that that started what I uh, think has been a really great relationship. I've been proud to work with you folks. Um, this this group is always, especially when it comes to Washington, uh, come as regional players. Uh, come to with uh, with a focus on on serving the transit dependent, uh, while also uh, showing uh, Washington D.C. that uh, climate change is in fact real. We're not waiting for climate change; it's here. Uh, and so, uh, so I've been really proud of all our shared accomplishments. Uh, I, I don't uh, I don't claim any of this uh, to be my own, um, and, but I am proud of all of that. I'm, I'm proud of the proposal that I put in. Uh, to uh, to try to um, uh, re remain here, but I am also uh, very respectful of of leadership and uh, being able to have uh, the team that they feel comfortable with. Uh, and so I'm not arrogant enough to think I'm the only person that can do this. Uh, I know Joel. Uh, I respect Joel a lot. Uh, he will serve you very very well. So uh, thank you again for everything. I, I appreciate that and, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Rotkin. Given the uncertainty of you know what's going to happen in November, can you give us any idea about whether visits from uh, delegations from Santa Cruz will make sense at some particular time of the year? Uh, or was it just so uncertain at this point that it's no way really to know? Yeah, I think I think right now, I, I you know, uh, you know, never, never a visit never hurts, of course. Uh, but there's also, of course, there's there's limited resources to to, to make those travels. But uh, I think right now, with with the uncertainty over the election, it probably doesn't make sense to you know to make a visit right now. But it's, it's certainly uh, early in the year, and you know, I know that APTA has their legislative meeting in the year, but maybe even coming earlier in the year next year to kind of talk about uh, talk about what your priorities and policy changes. I, I 
like I mentioned, it's probably not too early to start talking to Capitol Hill and the congressional delegation about any policy changes that we might want to do in, in the next reauthorization bill to kind of get in line for that. So, um, um, yeah, again, it's never it's never a bad time to uh, to come and, and talk about your message. Any other questions? All right, we'll go to public I, comment. I, I was going to say something. Oh, sorry, sorry, okay. uh, Director Dutra. I don't see uh, until you speak. I don't see your. My apologies. Go ahead. I was. Gonna, I just wanted to say thank you, Chris, for all the hard work that you've done for Metro over the years. Um, I, you know, I. I'm sure many people appreciate you and all the hard work that you've done and them and the millions of dollars you've helped bring into our, our um, organization. So thanks again. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to public comments on this item. Welcome back. Benjamin Pika. Um, I don't know if this is something that's already known, but I was just curious if the increases in the uh, federal allocation uh, accounts for inflation. That's a that's a good question. I I, I think I guess the 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 short answer is no, but I do think that you know what what Congress did when they created this um, this infrastructure bill in 2021 was they gave you know they 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 allocated money over a five year period. The first year they it, there was it was about a 30 percent increase in formula funding for that very first year FY 22, uh, and then after that uh, more incremental. I think the idea was inflationary increases of about two two and a half percent every year i don't think that they anticipated inflation was going to to blow up in the way that it did so uh so probably not directly related to inflation but that was probably their original idea thank you thank you any additional public comment seeing none we will bring it back to the board any final comments Say thank you, Chris, for your past uh, support and uh, the success that we've had here at Metro with you. Uh, been very much appreciated. Um, do you see the of the members of Congress uh, that represent this area in transportation? Do you, who do you see as likely winners to carry on, and uh, who, who we should target? I know your your successor will let us know that too. But who do you think yeah. in this region? Yeah, I think, you know, we've been very, very fortunate to have a, a fantastic congressional delegation. And right now, Congressman Panetta, Congressman Lofgren are really locked in at, uh, as far as being able to serve this, um, <clears throat> serve the region. They're, uh, they're very attuned to transportation issues and, uh, and, and they, they uh, have a great respect for, for Metro as an agency. So I think that's going to be good. I, uh, I would say that, um, you know, we're going to have a new U.S. Senator uh, from California, uh, actually not, not starting in January, but right after the election is certified. I guess you got us uh, voting twice for Senate, right? You've got a special election to fill Senator Feinstein's seat between now and the end of the year. And then, um, and it's looking, you know, right now, if, if the polls are correct, uh, Congressman Adam Schiff, who, who represents the Los Angeles County area, will be the next senator. I've worked with him, actually, uh, for the last 20 or so years that he's been in Congress. I've worked with him uh, on behalf of a client down in um, in uh, Southern California, and he's a great uh, supporter of transit. And uh, um, uh, Supervisor McPherson, you may remember Adam from when he was in the legislature, and he he created the uh, the gold what they what was then called the Gold Line Authority, which created a light rail system, kind of going east from LA through Pasadena. Um, so he's a great supporter of transit. I think he'll be a really good asset uh, to the delegation uh, and add to uh, Senator Padilla and, and the two uh, House members. You don't think a Dodgers win in the World Series is going to carry Steve Garvey? That <laughs> <laughs> could do it. That could do it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate uh, all your work for us and uh, and for this update today. Thank you. Take care. Okay, we are going to move on now to item 14, which is consideration of award of contract to Plug Project Holding Co. LLC for delivery and maintenance of a mobile hydrogen fuel solution and to furnish liquid hydrogen fuel in an amount not to exceed 4,563,303 and to approve a contract contingency of 456,330 for a total not to exceed amount of 5,000,000. 
Well, good morning, directors, Derek Toops, district staff. I uh, want to suggest maybe it's a good time to get up, take a stretch. We've been in here two yeah. hours. <laughs> I see that. Uh, I, we're going to be bringing three items to, to your attention today. It's been a while since staff has brought an update on our hydrogen zero emission bus uh, program. We've been working very tirelessly over the past nine months. That's when I started it, of course, in, in the time leading up to that. Um, but we'll be talking about three items, one of which is already on your consent calendar, and that is the Alliance for Renewable Clean Hydrogen Energy Systems, ARCHES. Uh, Michael Pimentel did mention the ARCHES program, and I think most of you are already familiar with ARCHES, but I just want to share a little bit of information and an update about the sub-recipient agreement that you approved earlier today on Action 9. Uh, then we will talk about this act, this item, item 14, a plug power contract for a mobile hydrogen fuel fueler solution. And then uh, we can either pause at that point so you can take your action, or if you prefer, I could continue to present the uh, the subsequent item, item 15, which is for a related matter, or for our design build of a permanent hydrogen. So, so with that, I uh, just want to start, again, going backward uh, to the item that you approved on your consent calendar earlier today and talk a little bit about Arches. Arches was awarded uh, $1.2 billion uh, earlier this year from the, the U.S. Department of Energy. And as Michael mentioned, that's being leveraged with $11.4 billion of additional funding through the state and private uh, parties. The, the purpose of Arches is really to create a marketplace for hydrogen fuel in California. And the purpose of those, D those hydrogen hubs, well, there'll be up to 12 of them, I'm sorry, up to 10 of them nationwide. I believe seven have been identified to date and uh, four of them have been uh, awarded. California was the first, but it's to, to create production of hydrogen fuel and ideally green hydrogen fuel that's made from electrolytic hydrogen water using solar power and wind, as well as biogas reform green fuel, which is also a, a, a renewable with low carbon intensity, uh, as opposed to other forms of hydrogen that come from reformed methane and natural gas. Uh, that is the biggest focus of the Arches program is to create the supply chain of the fuel, but it's also to match off takers like Metro with those producers so that we can consume that fuel and create these emissions uh, in the state. The verticals in this program are not just limited to bus transit. It's also for freight, for cargo ships, and for many other uses throughout the state. Uh, the, the first phase of Arches is underway now. It's uh, phase one. This slide's a little bit hard to see if you don't have glasses, but uh, phase one is the deployment planning phase. And so that began uh, at, shortly after the DOE awarded the funds to uh, Arches in California. Where uh, what we had you approved today on your consent agenda was a subrecipient agreement for Metro to specifically become engaged in uh, that award. We are one of 13 transit agencies in California that were included in the Arches program. So we're very lucky to be uh, one of those 13. A lot of the other agencies are much larger uh, from the big metro areas in the state. Uh, as soon as we adopt that plan, we can unlock that funding and begin spending it. And so we're working with our consultant, the Center for Transportation and the Environment, and through ARCHES to try to quickly de develop our plan. We probably are as aggressive as any other agency in the state because of the, the necessity based on large order that we placed in 2023 for 53 fuel cell buses. So we're trying to get that plan uh, hammered out. Now that you've approved the, the agreement, we can begin work on it. By the end of the calendar year, that's our goal. And as soon as it's adopted, then we, we will hopefully be uh, moved into a notice to proceed for phase two, which is the capital spending phase. Uh, the funding shown on this slide is just to give you an indication of that, that $25 million that we think we, we could be eligible for. As it initially envisioned, it needs to be memorialized in the plan. It would be $4 million for the fuel infrastructure, the, the contracts that are on uh, today's agenda. Another 750000 to help upgrade our maintenance facility across the street uh, to support gas detection for hydrogen as well as other safety upgrades. About a million dollars that could go toward workforce training. And then uh, an additional $18.9 million that could go for the purchase of additional fuel cell buses in the future, all the way out through 2032. And so, again, you've approved that item to allow us to try to go and get those funds unlocked. And that's Pivotal for today because the two items that we bring to you require a lot of capital funding. And we're trying to use some of that Arches money on these two contracts. Before we get into the contracts, I want to talk a little bit about hydrogen as a, as a fueling source and some of the challenges that it presents to, to the agency. So when we started on the procurements, and we did two procurements in the last uh, several months to, to get to these two awards that we're bringing to you today, we were looking at the items on this slide. Uh, how quickly can the bus be fueled? 
uh, from the, the machinery that you know, delivers the fuel to the bus. Uh, believe it or not, hydrogen being the type of cryogenic gas that it is, it, it's not as fast as, uh, you know, you're unleaded or, or even diesel. It's similar to our LNG CNG facilities that we've been operating here at the district since 2012. Uh, but it does, uh, there's a, a range of speed depending on the specific equipment that you select. In terms of storage capacity, a lot of agencies around the U.S. right now are dipping a toe into the ZEB program. They'll buy one or two fuel cell buses, maybe five. Very large agencies like Samtrans or SEPTA, maybe 10. But Metro, believe it or not, had the largest order in the nation at 53. Uh, that has now been surpassed by a few of our peers, but these are much bigger agencies. So when we looked into what we could uh, fuel our buses with, a, a limited solution really couldn't meet our long-term needs. However, at the same time, the speed of how quickly you can develop a permanent facility put us in a bind because we couldn't get that kind of facility built fast enough to fuel our buses. So we had to pivot very quickly and identify an alternative source for uh, a short-term solution and also go and find funding for to be able to do. Um, there are two types of infrastructure, largely for the on-site storage, and that's a semi-permanent or portable solution and a permanent solution. On the semi portable, you can support up to about 30 buses at the high end with uh, liquid hydrogen or LH2 fuel. If you have a gaseous storage, which is also commonly available, very few few buses, up to about five, can be supported. Maybe 10 if you add uh, scaled backup tanks. Uh, these types of solutions are generally considered off the shelf, and although they do have long leads to to manufacture them, there are many of them in production already. Uh, Walmart, Amazon, and a lot of other retailers, large retailers in the U.S. use these at their warehouses, so they're they're readily available in the market. And um, typically, they come with a single dispenser. The whole unit is self-contained, so it's either on a truck, as shown in the slide on the left, or it could be on a skid, which is like a palletized solution that you place on your property. But it doesn't require uh, breaking into the ground and doing heavy infrastructure to support it. Uh, typically, one of these mobile fuelers would take about 12 minutes to fuel a single bus, so it's about half the speed of a permanent infrastructure. There are examples near us, AC Transit's been working with hydrogen for two decades, and we've had the opportunity to go visit a few of our peers who've been to see AC Transit's facility, OCTA, Foothill Transit, and uh, those permanent infrastructures take about 18 to 24 months to complete construction. Uh, they can provide you obviously a lot higher capacity and also faster fill time of about six minutes per bus. Uh, I mentioned before gaseous and liquid storage. I just want to reiterate that we did examine and invite bids from uh, the industry for gaseous or liquid solutions because we wanted to see truly what's out there in the market. And we did have uh, both gaseous and liquid proposals uh, received. Unfortunately, none of the gaseous solutions could meet our, our capacity requirements. And uh, we were able to find uh, liquid solutions that do. And so with regard to the current item, item 14.1 that's before you, we are recommending a contract award to plug power. Uh, LLC. They're based out of Houston, Texas. This would be for a 1,500-kilogram portable mobile refueler. Uh, the op operation of this would be very similar to our current LNG CNG operations, so our facilities team will uh, be able to ease into the transition to hydrogen quite easily with appropriate training. Uh, there will be a single nozzle or pump, uh, and we will be able to fuel for about eight hours a day. We are going to be using a grant that we received. Uh, we just got word two weeks ago from the California Energy Commission, CEC, it's called the Energize Program, and they're going to provide $2.8 million in capital costs toward the expenditure uh, before you. And so the next slide is just showing you the Judy Cases operations yard across the street and where we're thinking we'll be placing the uh, infrastructure. The first thing we have to do is upgrade our electrical uh, infrastructure, just the breakers there. We have to make a quick improvement with PG&E. We think we're going to get that done in about 90 days. That'll pave the way for us to put the portable fuel on site. Uh, we're going to, it is mobile, so it has the ability to be moved. We know that that is a, plain, a flood plain. It has had historic flooding, so with that risk in mind, uh, we're placing it there uh, to keep it out of the way of uh, daily operation. It's possible that as we break ground and begin construction of the permanent facility, we would look to relocate this mobile fueler to one of our other sites. Uh, in, in the region. And so that's another thing that it, it provides. So we'll also provide reserve capacity. Uh, a lot of our peers who have hydrogen have said one of their challenges is if the machine is down for maintenance or if they have an issue, they really couldn't make their pullout. And they all advise, you know, get a backup, have at least two uh, fuel sources. And so this provides us that extra insurance that we didn't have in our original plan. 
And uh, as was mentioned, the budget before you, line item one there summarizes the capital costs and one year maintenance at 3.28 million, sorry, 26 million. And again, 90% uh, of that capital cost is coming from the CDC Energize grant that was just awarded. That grant requires a 10% local match. What we're planning to do is match that with the Arches funding. And Arches at this point is not confirmed, but we believe we'll be able to use it for maintenance as well, which is great. Uh, and then there are options in this contract for the relocation of the machine in the future, as well as a 10% contingency. That contingency could go toward uh, any unforeseen challenges with the implementation, but also to cover additional extended warranties for up to three years on the contract. And finally, there is a provision by Plug Power to provide liquid hydrogen fuel to Metro at $11.25 per kilogram through this contract. It's not required that we procure the fuel through the contract, but it is... Uh, a competitive price point right now, that's about as good of pricing as we've seen on the market. We've seen it as high as 25 cents per kilogram. Uh, you should also keep in mind that the energy density of hydrogen is a little bit stronger uh, than uh, like a gallon of diesel is expected to do five miles on a bus, but one kilogram of hydrogen is currently between seven to 10 uh, miles for that bus. So about a two to one ratio. So with that, uh, we just want to mention the timeline for implementation real quickly. We're hoping to get uh, this unit permitted quickly. We've already been in discussion with uh, the city of Santa Cruz planning and building and safety department. That's the authority that has jurisdiction over that permit. Uh, because it's going to be sited on the property where we already have the LNG CNG, we don't believe it will require any land use change uh, or zoning change. Uh, and because it's a, a portable uh, unit, this one will not require any other changes to the, the land use. So with that, we're hoping to get the permit by February, uh, signed off into January and begin to uh, to basically have this up and running to begin fueling our buses by February. That's the end. And uh, I just have your action on the board if you want to decide, Chair Brown, to continue the presentation or you can uh, dialogue this item. We could continue after. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense to take these two items together, but let's pause to see if there's any questions on this part of it, and then we'll move on to the, the next item and do all the actions at once. Yes. I have two questions. Um, do we need to get two of these? If you only fuel 30 buses, and we have 52. Right. So we, we do not believe we do because there's a big transition underway with regard to our uh, moving from legacy diesel and CNG fleet to the use of hydrogen as a daily full-time fuel. Uh, staff has been very successful in getting our contingency fleet up. Uh, and we have adequate buses right now to, to make the daily pullouts. With the hydrogen buses coming in, there will be a large workforce development training uh, transition happening as soon as side wing can use. Correct. We'll we'll have a period of time where we have you know 53 new buses coming in and 52 old buses, and we'll be retiring them. The the deadline to really retire the old buses is tied to a grant we got through the Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Fund. I think you all will remember when Volkswagen was found. Uh, Correct. There was a lot of money that was provided in the San Joaquin uh, Air Pollution Control District. has been administering that. We were very fortunate. Our district secured 52 uh, vouchers through that program, which pay $480,000 per bus. But we have to dismantle the engines of those older buses. So in essence, we'll be a one for one swap for 52 and 53 vouchers. But I think um, the, the current forecast of the delivery, the first bus should be arriving in early November. Uh, then we won't see other buses until toward the end of the calendar year. We'll see maybe five or six uh, this year. I think the current delivery schedule goes for the 40 foot buses. There's 44 of those. Those are going to be here by roughly the end of the fiscal year in June. Uh, but, and I'll be talking more about the permanent construction. We're going to try to have that facility built by 20, by the beginning of 2026. So we don't think we'll need uh, two because we won't be using these as our own buses in full time. The environmental mitigation requires those engines be dismantled by the summer of 2026. That's what the agreement says. So that's, that's our window that we have to basically make the migration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, the useful life is like just two years, the, the temporary. The, the useful life of this fueler? Yes. No, this is actually more or less uh, akin to a permanent. This is a very robust device. What happens when you get a permanent facility? You just like uh, we sell it either, to somebody else? Or... That's correct. Our CFO has discussed the opportunity. to. There are going to be many other agencies that weren't as ambitious as Metro to go and be on the forefront of this that will have a need and these will have resale value. Uh, they also, again, have intrinsic value. Foothill Transit made the mistake after they started with the mobile fueler and built their permanent. They 
quickly did offload the, the mobile one. And then their facility had some downtime and they regretted it. So their advice to us was keep it and, uh, and you're going to use it. And, you know, there's a lot of other things that Corby's going to be working on uh, in our agency, including looking at our overall facilities. We have a, a study underway. If we ever did have another site, say in South County, you know, this is the perfect type of way to transition a, a bridge to have fuel at both sites. And we got a little, little bit of this in the uh, legislative reports, but What's the progress? We've got a huge amount of money from the federal government to build two, I believe, facilities in California um, that would create green hydrogen, one near LA and one near Oakland. So I think it's even more than two. What we've been in touch, Margo's heard from uh, the city of Lancaster in the Central Valley, is doing something very unique. They're creating a public utility, and uh, that's going to be making electrolytic hydrogen from solar power uh, in the Central Valley. And there are other entities already operating on biogas from you know, dairies, as well as we've had, we have a meeting up next week. There's folks that are looking at our local wastewater treatment in our landfills to capture all that waste uh, gas, the methane that comes off of those uh, those types of facilities and to capture it and to put it in the field. Everybody so they do that now. Yeah. But Arches has several uh, sub-recipients that are private sector parties that are developing fuel, including one we know that's based here in Santa Cruz, a community that is, is local. So there's reason to believe that Reasonably, after we get some knowing here, but I'm actually doing that. Absolutely, I think that's the promise of Arches, and really the the from the IAJ all the way down, all of the effort nationwide to push this trail. It, it wouldn't it wouldn't see its purpose if it wasn't in, you know if that didn't occur. So it will have to occur because we're, we're all forces moving in that direction. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, but we expect a. Um, 2.8 million of the total $5 million cost to come from the Arches grant. From the CEC Energize grant. Oh, sorry, the Energize grant, 10% local match from the Arches, 4 million is coming from Arches in total that we would be able to use for fueling station. So that gets us to um, 3.2, 3.3 million. Is the remainder of um, that, the 1.7 million or so, is that come out of the, the operating cost? The, the the fuel cost is really excluded from the capital cost, even though we've highlighted it in the agreement. Because should we choose to procure it through these two entities that we're presenting today, uh, those costs would need to be authorized through the contract that you're approving. But uh, money is already it, it's already identified in our budget to pay for fuel. So that's today diesel and LNG fuel, and tomorrow it'll become a phased amount where it'll be less diesel and LNG, eventually no diesel and less LNG and more hydrogen year over year. We have if you if you look at our year adopted. Uh, zero emission bus transition rollout plan. There's a chart on that, and I, I should have put it in the slide actually that shows the expected diminishing spend on diesel and LNG over year over year, and in the offset as that would be uh, increasing with hydrogen. So, yes. So, this this cost is in line with our adopted budget. It's not coming in uh, below what we expected. That's correct. And Chuck is, is here to support that if you need any further questions, but I would say that. Metro has been extremely fortunate in the funding that we've been able to secure for the zero emission bus transition. I would say more so than any other entity in the state, we got the largest haul of the Volkswagen mitigation that we know of. We got the largest haul of the HFIP, which is the uh, CARB's um, hybrid incentive voucher program. We're getting that for 50 of our 53, and you can only get 50 in a year. We're going to try to apply for the next three as soon as the first three buses get redeemed, which is how, you know, how it works. But we think we'll get all 53. Uh, those provide 258,000 per bus. So those two sources alone paid for 750,000 of every bus. Uh, and then in addition to that, most of the infrastructure, that, the next item that I'm gonna present is funded through the TERSA program that Michael was highlighting, Transit Intercity Rail Capital. That we had a 30 plus million dollar grant in FY23 that is funding uh, $10 million of the capital. And, and there's additional overlap with the maintenance upgrade. So we can, we, TERSIP allows us to move money between elements. And so if the arches is gr green lighted for the maintenance facility upgrade, we're going to allocate the 1.2 million that was in TERSIP for that same purpose to the Messer contract. So basically, 100% of the capital and maintenance for both of the contracts before you make would be fully funded, provided that the arches money is allowed to, to be expended on maintenance and capital. Uh, when you were evaluating the companies that you were going to select, <clears throat> was service and support um, part of that? Because this is one pump and one machine, and 
if it does work, you know. It's great, Director Downing, that you brought that up. We actually had, as I mentioned, two procurements. The first procurement actually ended in a failed outcome. And the plug contract, I didn't mention it, is you can see it says there's a single source contract. Plug uh, was not a bidder to our mobile hydrogen fuel solution RFP. We actually received two bids. One was for a gaseous solution. One was for a liquid uh, solution. We recommended award to the liquid. They were the highest ranked. And we went through a prolonged negotiation with that company, uh, who I won't mention. But they actually walked away because we were so um, focused on the, the ongoing maintenance and the availability. We do have key performance indicators in these contracts with liquidated damage provision. If the vendor is unable to, uh, to maintain the, the unit to 99% availability, and if we miss pull out, there are financial damages that would be uh, that they would be subjected to. That company could not uh, accept the terms because they're used to doing this again in a pilot with five or ten buses, but very few agencies have crossed the threshold where we're at. So this is going to be our, our dominant thing. So they walked last month. You may recall you approved on your uh, your your slate an item that allows us to go to the open market to see what else was out there. We had already been receiving concurrent to those procurements many unsolicited proposals from folks who didn't respond to the RFP but had said we can we can provide this solution. We actually evaluated five additional solutions and we landed on plug as the only one that can meet our needs in the time for this. Uh, we'll let's hold off on that. Um, I'm gonna go to well actually let's go to this the next item that's okay. related to this mm -hmm. and then we'll do public comment for both items and then we'll take a motion to get both items approved just because they're related it seems like we might as well just move forward. Great. I'll try to be brief since uh, in the interest of time. So the last uh, item 15 is, again, it's the recommendation for a contract for the design, build, and maintenance to Messer LLC, uh, who's a provider of uh, hydrogen fuel infrastructure and fuel. And it includes a provision as well for a fuel supply agreement. Um, this is for the originally envisioned facility that was in our TERSIP grant, which is the, the permanent infrastructure. Uh, this is a very dense slide, and I won't try to explain it all, but I just want to highlight some of the key features of what will be built for here on our premises. Very similar to our current LNG CNG facility. Uh, and I'll just, well, this has a pointer. Yeah, it does. So I don't know, I'll use this side. Okay, I'll just go point to it. But basically, there's a 25,000 gallon tank to hold liquid hydrogen. That's the largest part of the. the Solution. There are vaporizers that uh, will compress the hydrogen uh, gas. And also, we have two pumps. Uh, the pumps, the reason they put two, both pumps have dual cylinders, and you really only need one pump at a time to support up to the 50 buses that are in our fleet today. But we're planning for future expansion because ours have plan that show us continuing to invest in hydrogen technology as our future. Uh, right now, that extra pump is the most vulnerable part of a fuel facility where other agencies have had downtime. It's been their pumps that go down. So in addition to the pump having its own built-in redundancy, there's what they call an N plus one pump that you can fail over to the secondary pump. So that is the number one mitigation to uh, to downtime or non-availability of your facility. In addition to that, uh, when you compress the fuel into a gas, there's an overflow of gaseous storage tank. And this is key because uh, in the hydrogen fuel and also with LNG, uh, in the science, the tank is sitting out in ambient temperatures and the sun is hitting it every day and the temperature is going up a little bit inside the fuel that's inside of there. Even though it's liquid, it's still warming. When you take a delivery off of a, a hydrogen or an LNG truck, that cryogenically created fuel is very cool. And when you try to pump the cool fuel into the hot fuel, it literally creates little eruptions and some of the fuel turns from a liquid into a vapor or gas and it naturally goes to the top of the tank. And then the only way to deal with that situation is they vent. Venting is not a harmful sounding word, but um, boil off is a term or fugitive emission, which really means you're losing your So can you imagine if you drove your car to Costco and fueled it and you found out that up to 17% of your fuel was just evaporating? That's in essence what some of these fuels create that risk. So what the industry has done is they've created what's called a boil off compressor, which is an optional item in our contract, and you'll see that on the next slide, on the funding slide, it's almost a million dollars, but it pays for itself in one year because when that gas is vented, it's captured by that boil-off compressor and then immediately compressed into the gas and storage tube. So you, you can capture not all, but a majority of that off that boil-off or fugitive emission. 
And then finally, um, there will be dispensers. We'll have two dispensers in line with our current fuel island to uh, fuel the buses over across the street. Um, as proposed, I'll show you on the next slide. We're, we're looking at two locations in the yard where we would place uh, the permanent construction. The preferred location is in the back behind the bus garage on the uh, south side of the building. And this is the side that's already zoned for permanent fuel storage and um, dispensing infrastructure. So that would require the least effort with regard to permitting. If it's on basically this two thirds, then it will require a zoning change, but it's still something the city we've already talked to and wouldn't be that difficult to achieve. Um, it is in the floodplain. The vendor that we've selected has said they can they can completely mitigate any risk related to the flooding at no additional cost in the way that they've designed the facility. They believe they can fit it there. That preserves the majority of our uh, space that we need to park the buses, which is really uh, a challenge if we were to put it anywhere else, even out here in the center. So when we begin the design, we're going to attempt to get it uh, approved and permitted for that location. Mm -hmm. And then here's the cost again. I just want to kind of summarize the 9.3 million for the design build, which is the the full capital cost of the project, is funded with 8.9 million in a, the TERSIP grant today. That's 100 uh, percent from TERSIP. We have 1.2 million in TERSIP allocated for upgrade of the bus maintenance facility across the street. Arch has also allocated funding, and again, I would say in in respect to John Ergo and my predecessor, Wanda Momin, just to who were very aggressive and succeeded in getting all of these grants. Um, you know, scattershot, we, we asked for the same items for multiple grants. Didn't expect we'd get all the grants and we got them all. So now we have the luxury of trying to reprogram some of the funding between the components. And if we can move that 1.2, then this is 100% paid for through that terse grant. And that would include the boil off compressor option item, which takes the total capital to 10.2 million. Uh, in addition to that, we've included in the contract uh, early completion bonus. I just want to quickly jump two sl slides ahead and show you what this would do. Um, this would incentivize Messer. Again, I mentioned before the normal construction time for a facility like this is in the 18 to 24 months time. If we broke ground, uh, well, we have to do design. If we issue the notice to proceed by January 1st and uh, get through design, it'll take to, to the end of 2026 ordinarily even into 2027 to complete this type of a facility. So what we've done, and this was part of the RFP to get a faster delivery time, we added a, a day for day incentive, a performance bonus. Every day that they complete early up to hundred days, they could qualify for a $2,500 bonus. And of course that yielded the intended result. We got a 12 month proposed delivery schedule. So if they can, uh, can meet that schedule, we'll be able to complete this by the end of next calendar year, which is our goal. I'm going to go back to the funding. So the third item there includes that early completion bonus as well as a 10% contingency on the contract because this is a design build and uh, we do expect change orders and unforeseen uh, challenges with the work. The fourth item is for nine up to nine years. The contract is framed as a three-year base, ironically similar to the legislative one that was on your slate today, but this is a normal thing for a capital project. Three-year base with two three-year option periods and the total cost of maintenance for the nine years is just under $3 million in, in the firm fixed price proposal that we received. So that's about a uh, million dollars every uh, every term, three years with 333,000 a year. And um, again, we believe the arch is funding, we're not 100% certain, but they, it's looking like they're gonna allow that to be used for maintenance and we'll cover that cost. And then the fuel supply, the remaining items are just looking at the operating budget that would cover the cost of fuel. Messer did propose similar to plug $11.37 per kilogram in year one through three with an option uh, for future years that is diminishing as low as $9.88 uh, per kilogram. And we do expect that over nine years, the picture of funding and for the cost of fuel is going to go down, we hope, with Arches delivering its, its vision. And so this contract would allow us to uh, negotiate that at each interval. And with that, I will just wrap by showing you the deployment plan or schedule. Uh, we do also expect to be negotiating in November to get to the final contract and resolve those funding questions with Arches. Uh, issuing a notice to proceed in December and beginning work in, in, in uh, right away. Well, the design will take quite a bit longer for this type of a facility. So we're expecting that to go out through the end of the fiscal year and obtaining the permits by July of 2025. Uh, 
long lead items are already actually being procured by this vendor at risk. They have you know enough demand in the market that they're willing to take on that risk, which is great. That's one of the things that allowed us to get that aggressive schedule. And uh, it will take basically till the summer to have the equipment shipped on site and to begin uh, construction. Of course, there is some site prep work that we need to do as well with regard to electrical and foundational work. Uh, we do currently, again, with the incentive, the schedule showing potentially completion by the end of next calendar year. And, uh, and we would commission the facility for early 2026. And uh, the only other, other thing I'll just show this for anyone who is, uh, you know, concerned about the high cost item related to the fuel. This is what was forecasted in terms of our fuel demand for those three years. Uh, I'd be happy to provide, if upon request, the slide in our Z plan that shows the transition between diesel and LNG to hydrogen over the next 20 year time frame. And then your recommended uh, action. We could go back to the one for 14 and you can take them one at a time. Okay. Sure. Uh, we're the first hydrogen station in the county, correct? To my knowledge, we would be. I remember. Hydrogen. I wondered if there is anyone else considering such, and would we be available to fuel other agencies and their vehicles in this nine-year window? It's interesting. It's a great question, Director Pazler. Uh, in the application, the TERSIP grant, it was mentioned that the idea of a quote-unquote over-the-fence fueling for general public or for other agencies who might have staff cars uh, is an idea. The contract does allow a provision for a future public station. There's one thing, uh, buses are fueling at a different pressure. It's 350 bar, that's called H35. And then cars like the Toyota Mirai and Honda hydrogen car, they fuel at what's called H70 or 700 bar of pressure. So you couldn't simply uh, you know, just hook, hook up another fuel dispenser to the current base infrastructure. There's a provision in the contract through a change order that we can add that. Now, if you know our yard, you know there's a diesel tank right near the, the street side on River Street. That will eventually go away when the last diesel bus is, is retired. And so that is the area we've identified as a potential site for a public future hydrogen. And I'll offer, I was thinking mostly of uh, city or county you know, heavy duty. Fleet, fleet. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. If they're, if they're at 350 bar, I think that would be something subject to, uh, you know, your board and Corey's decision whether or not we would have the ability to have capacity for that. We do expect we're going to be taking fuel deliveries as often as every one to two days when we get to the 53 buses. So we will be using the fuel quickly. One thing, again, with hydrogen, because of the venting risk, the faster you use it, it's better because if it sits for a long time, you risk it. We have an anticipated date for the uh, retirement of DC or LNG. The facility, 13 years. is the, Currently, the last uh, useful life of our current CNG fleet would be 13 years from today. We think that's when that would be, uh, you know, I think it would be decommissioned and provided we continue down that path of going all hydrogen or battery. We're currently ahead of schedule. The, ICT, the CARB uh, intent, excuse me, the ICT Innovative Clean Transit Rule says Every agency in the state by 2040 has to be 100% Zen. We're on forecast for 2037. Years ahead of schedule. Um, great. Well, a lot of the elements of the plan will be redundancy in the pumps, uh, will be redundancy in keeping a mobile unit too. Um, and uh, well, that it's pretty much all paid for with all our great grants. Um, the only thing that gives me pause is that placing the permanent facility in the flood plan. I know you said promised it would uh, would be resistant, but it kind of reminds me of like Jurassic Park, like the dinosaurs are sterile. <laughs> it's definitely a big concern for us as well. And as we enter design in conclusion with the County Department of Environmental Health, we've been talking to the city permitting and planning departments. Uh, this will be a topic that we we address together uh, proactively to see is this feasible. They, they believe that the equipment that would be at risk can be elevated using pedestals. And well, yeah, I mean, it'll be addressed in the permitting process. So during the design yeah. phase, it's decided to move forward today. It's more than it's currently just over water, it's rolling water. We haven't really yeah. yet. I mean, it's not ideal. I think, if, again, if you ask any staff here, we, we've been puzzled about our space constraints and our challenges, which is why we're looking at what do we do. And it's not just Metro. If you talk to our peers at Monterey Salinas and just about every other transit agency in the nation, batteries and hydrogen create infrastructure demand that wasn't present five, 10 years ago. And uh, you have to have additional space, but we are out of space on this campus. 
that is that is really why we're we're looking at this. the bus room. Yes. Right. Should I go back, Chair Brown, to the slide that shows the action for the first item? Yeah, I'm going to do public comment first, and then when we come back, we'll take action on on each item. Uh, do we have any public comment on items 14 or 15? Um, so I had some concerns and questions. Um, I I guess I'll start with uh, safety as well as operations impact for having a public hydrogen facility on site. I don't know if that's something we can address now, but I guess wanted to express that concern. Um, and then as well, um, as we move away from diesel, um, would it be potentially better space saving? Because as we expand and add to our fleet, we're going to need space to store all of those buses. Um, would it make sense and would it be cheaper, in fact, to replace the diesel fueling facility with the hydrogen fuel. So I think I can answer both of your questions. Um, so with regard to safety, hydrogen fuel is a uh, flammable gas. It's it's definitely a safety concern like all gas, uh, the diesel as well as the liquid uh, natural gas that we've been working with since 2012. Our staff, and I just want to highlight Freddie Roche and his team in facilities, they work every day and we have uh, seasoned vendors that work with LNG and CNG. And they're very similar fuels, um, the properties of the fuels. They're, they're also different in some regards. But um, during the design, we'll be working with a national entity called the Hydrogen Safety Panel. They're uh, a nationwide organization that conducts safety uh, audits and testing and recommended best practices. Uh, that is part of our RFP. And then we'll be re they'll be reviewing our designs and recommending uh, safety improvements. Uh, also mentioned in the TERSUP grant, our federal uh, FTA 5339 grant from 23, the $20 million grant that Chris mentioned, and the ARCHES. Together, we have $1.7 million in workforce training allocated for ZEB transition training. And we'll be spending that money on our workforce, educating them about battery buses as well as hydrogen, proper operation for the fuel facilities, the buses themselves, fueling, uh, maintenance, et cetera. Uh, in terms of the diesel question, we can't retire that thing today because we have a dependency on diesel buses in this fleet for another several years. As soon as those the last diesel bus is retired, and I don't remember the exact year, I think it's about five years out. They're 2014, so we're talking about 2026, the earliest we can retire. So in a few years, then we'd be decommissioning that diesel. And, and another thing, that where that diesel tank is, uh, we cannot put hydrogen because it's too close to the power line. It does not meet regulations. Like without the building wall, large wall. Yeah. And sorry, a clarification on my first question. Uh, the, the public tank um, that would potentially be coming, is that meaning members of the public would be coming to fuel It's not been designed or determined. It's just an idea of overarch face. And pro probably more for fleet vehicles, as was mentioned by the director, like uh, city or county. Gotcha. Okay. All right. If there's no additional public comments, we'll bring it back to the board. And uh, we'll take action on items uh, 14 and 15. Yeah. We have approval of items 14 and 15. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sure, did you guys? Okay, um, we have a motion and a second. Did you get to the uh, Mike? Yeah, oh, and I probably can. Right. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, for both Thank items 14 and 15. 14 and 15. All right. Um, and is there any questions or comments on uh, Zoom for our Zoom participants before we go to a vote? Okay. All right. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote then. Are you doing them just to make sure? Are you doing them one at a time on the vote or are you doing them together? Oh, we're doing them together. Them okay. Okay, Director Brown? Aye. Director Downey? Aye. Du uh, Director Dutra has left the meeting. Director Colin Terry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Key Rose Carter? Aye. Uh, and Director Rockin? Aye. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we are going to move on to item 16, our CEO oral report. Good. I'll try to be brief. I've been there a long time. Um, so the, we had the bus rodeo last uh, last Saturday. Uh, it was said it was a great success. Uh, we had uh, we had four categories: we had Veracruz, 
fixed route, uh, fleet, and then managers. And Freddie uh, Rocha won the managers, and, and I did not. Uh, but it was a lot of fun driving a bus again. Uh, and a special thanks to uh, Director Rockton, Director Lind, Director uh, Hagler uh, for uh, their help uh, with this. It was it was a huge uh, uh, work on your part, standing out there in the sun and scoring everything, uh, but uh, really appreciated. Uh, we also have the Sentinel was there, uh, report our Sentinel staff uh, to report on this and. Uh, there was an article published in the Sunday edition, and it was also picked up by Mass Transit and MSN. So uh, we followed it with the company picnic, uh, lots of good food and games, and uh, uh, really enjoyable time. Uh, the board had requested a recruitment update at the last board meeting. Um, so to bring you up to speed on where we're at, uh, we, were, we are currently recruiting 20 provisional bus operators. Uh, for transit supervisors, there are three that are needed at this time. Uh, HR is currently uh, testing several candidates, and then we'll set up interviews. Uh, seven more are funded for future recru recruitment. Uh, lead mechanic, we're currently recruiting for one. Uh, vehicle service workers, uh, we have a candidate to start uh, pending criminal background check. Uh, paratransit operators for paracruise, uh, currently recruiting for one. Uh, safety and training program specialist, uh, currently reviewing the job description with the union, and then we'll, we'll start the recruitment. Grants analyst, uh, reviewing the job description uh, uh, with uh, between HR uh, manager and the union, and then we'll start the recruitment once that's finalized. Uh, marketing specialist, uh, it is funded, not currently recruiting due to uh, evaluating the need for it. And special projects manager, funded but not currently recruiting. Uh, once again, evaluating the need for that position. So, uh, to continue with the recruitment theme, HR participated in the Coconut Grove Employment Fair on October 17th. Approximately 50 people stopped by Metro Table to inquire and register as prospects uh, for uh, various positions. Um, HR received several prospects for vehicle service workers, custodial service workers, bus operator, van operators, uh, IT desk support, software engineer, arts and materials clerk, mechanic, customer service, senior planner, and admin positions. So it was a great turnout. Uh, new hires since September 4th, we've had uh, 24 in total, uh, one administrative assistant, 12 bus operators, one business systems programs manager, uh, one contract and purchasing manager, two custodial service workers, two customer service representatives, one dispatcher scheduler, one mechanic, two, two paratransit operators, and one paratransit supervisor. So a lot of hiring and uh, it will continue. Uh, let's see. Uh, so after the last uh, board meeting, uh, the following week, I met with the SEIU uh, representatives, sat down with, with Jordan and Gabby and uh, discuss uh, their needs. And uh, uh, so what we ultimately end up doing is, is uh, with this December study, we're adding in an additional position for that we'll be studying uh, for SEIU on this next study. Uh, so Metro is launching a uh, Your Voice Matters campaign. Uh, it, it'll be an opportunity to provide, uh, provide employees uh, an opportunity to submit positive suggestions on enhancing service, improving efficiency, and refining uh, processes uh, directly related. To, they'll be uh, submitted directly to management myself. Uh, no suggestion is too small on this. Everyone who submits a suggestion will be acknowledged and receive a special gift as a sign of Metro's appreciation. So the goal here is that we know that there, our employees have great ideas, great suggestions. They see things that we don't see, uh, and we want them to, to share with us so that we can make changes. 
some of these things may be really simple uh, for us to fix, and we're not aware of them right now. So our hope is that we can open up dialogue that uh, employees feel that when they do submit a comment, suggestion, that they're listened to and heard. So we'll acknowledge every one of those to make sure they know that we've we review and we've looked at it and we'll try to implement as many as we possibly can. Okay. Uh, Metro will be participating in two trunk or treat events today, October 25th. The first is sponsored by the County Sheriff and will be held at their headquarters in Soquel. Uh, Metro will be riding trips from the Capitola Mall to the event. The second is being held at the fairgrounds in Watsonville where Metro will be decorating the bus and setting up a booth to pass out candy and discuss Metro services. Uh, as was mentioned before, the Paracruz 20th anniversary uh, event uh, will be on November 15th from 11 to 2 p.m. We invite the board to, to come participate and celebrate. Uh, and I had the opportunity last week uh, to represent Metro as a volunteer wait staff uh, for Second Harvest Chef Dinner, which is one of their key fundraising events uh, for the food bank. Uh, so I was able to do that alongside uh, the UCSC Chancellor, Police Chief, the Sheriff, Fire Chief, uh, County Director of Community and Development and Infrastructure, and two of Metro's Board Directors, uh, Kristen Brown and Bruce McPherson. Uh, I thought it was an excellent event. It was long, we were tired <laughs> at the end of it, uh, but right. I'm really looking forward to, to doing it again next year. So, and that's the end of my report. Great, thank you. And I'll be recruiting a lot of you next year. <laughs> it is a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, okay, any questions? Comments? Okay. We will go to public comment on this item. Yes, please, come on up. It's short. Um, okay. I was just curious how the uh, employee recommendations differs from comment sheets. Uh, so the comment sheets uh, that right now are typically for uh, a lot of them are safety related. They're reviewed by supervisors, uh, and they, a lot of them don't make it to me. Actually, most all of them don't make it to me. Uh, I, I want to see them. I want to see, uh, and so they're going to be reviewed by myself and, and by a committee of, of managers to see what we can do. So uh, hopefully, it, it's it will be seen as a totally different process at the company. Thank you. I just want to thank Corey and Don for that uh, extra wage study in uh, December. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there's no further comments, we'll bring it back to the board. And if there's no further comment from the board, then that brings us to the end of our meeting. We will adjourn until our next regularly scheduled meeting on Friday, November 22nd at 9 a.m. here in the Metro offices. Till then, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and we'll see you next month.